Hello, Nate. Nate? Yes. Hi. Um, Madeline is in the other category. She needs to I'm be... I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Hey, Hello, Hetty. Good evening. Nate, are we being recorded now? There was an announcement that we were. We are, yeah. Yeah, we started the webinar uh, just to make sure everyone could get in. Because uh, I think there is some trouble. So, you know, essentially, okay. the, we haven't called the hearing or meeting to order, but we are being recorded. I'm waiting for one other commission member. Let's see. Hi. Hi, Antonia. Hello. Hello. Hey man, I have 701. Maybe we'll just give it one more minute. Looks like attendees are still arriving. So we'll... I have okay. I have chocolate and I have two different kinds of salsa and water. <laughs> You're right. set for a long evening, Hetty. I am, Pat. Yeah. I'm oh. <laughs> you forget your snacks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess we just wait one more minute. I just a few more have just joined. Yeah, it's fine. I think at 704, we could start. I have 703, so it'll just be like a minute. In the meantime, if anyone's here for the library to make a presentation, could you raise your hand? We'll promote you to panelists.
Um, let's see. Jim, I see your hand raised. I was trying to. All right, Mel, I think we're all set. To... OK. Um, let's see. So this is a continued hearing from um, August 22nd um, to consider um, changes to Jones Library. I'm going to read the preamble. Um, so pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, extended by chapter two of the acts of 2023, this public hearing and meeting of the town's historical commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance and members of the public is permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. A hyperlink to the hearing is posted on the town's online calendar. In accordance with the provisions of Article 3.6 of Amherst General Bylaws, preservation of let's see, historically significant buildings. This public hearing has been advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. So um, I'm gonna have a roll call. Um, Pat? Present. Eddie Startup? Present. Antonia? Present. And I am present and that's all of us. Um, so the sequence of today's hearing um, is as follows. We'll hear the applicant's presentation, um, and then we'll have questions from commissioners and staff. Following that, we'll have public comment, and then discussion among commissioners. Um, so we'll get to the public comment after questions by staff and commissioners. Um, okay, and yes, so just let's get started. <laughs> thank you, Madeline. Uh, I want to thank the commission for the time that you put in uh, on this already, and thank you for the care, and thank you for the time that you will put in again tonight. Uh, we understand the work you do is really quite Im important, and ever more so than with respect to the treasure of the Jones Library. But I want to start by asking Madeline a question, just for my clarification. So as I understand it, with respect to, uh, for example, the landscaping, the purview of the Historical Commission is not primarily aesthetic. It is to determine whether or not what is proposed uh, damages in any way uh, the architectural, historical, or cultural significance of the Jones Library. And if that understanding is incorrect, I, I'd really be grateful if you would tell me that it's incorrect. Because what you're going to hear tonight, uh, the change that we're proposing in the landscaping, we don't believe, obviously, uh, in any way diminishes the historic or architectural or cultural significance of the library. Indeed, as I think we mentioned last time, this landscaping plan is closer to what it would have been at the time that the Jones Library was built uh, than the landscaping plan that we had proposed before the value engineering. So, Madeline, is, it, is, is my understanding correct and the reason I ask you that is we've gone through, um, we went to the design uh, review committee, we went to the planning board, uh, where they made their own aesthetic judgments, if you will, about the various parts, including the landscaping plan. Uh, I thought what the Historical Commission was doing was somewhat different than that, and I just wanted to make sure that I've understood it correctly. Sure, yeah. So I'll, I'll mention that the the preservation restriction guides landscapes. It's not trying to return it to a period of significance, you know, when the library was built. And so the restriction guidelines state that a major alteration of the landscape, such as subdividing a property, 
altering or removing significant landscape features such as gardens, vistas, walks, plantings, walls, fences, ground disturbances affecting archaeological resources are all under the purview of the commission. Uh, and it says this, you know, this is not a comprehensive list. And so, um, you know, the planning board reviews it for a site plan review. They're not necessarily looking at it, you know, is the removal of a tree altering necessarily some value of the property there, you know, they looked at it, you know, does the drainage work? Is this still a workable site plan? Uh, and the commission has a little different perspective there. And so, you know, if, for instance, the addition was happening and there was no changes to the back landscape, right? No trees were being cut down or anything, then we wouldn't have a discussion about it. But because there's alterations now, we're moving mature trees, uh, you know, everything's changing. And then now there's no more changes with, you know, new proposed drainage or gardens or landscaping, then that's part of the review of the restriction. So again, I, I that's very helpful, but if you allow me to say not quite responsive to the question I asked. So is it is it is it the contention of the commission that they can make any judgment they want. They are not guided by the need to look and see if what we are proposing diminishes, detracts from the historical significance of the building. It's a little both, right? So right now, the landscape, right, supports the building, right? There's mature trees. And so if you're saying you're cutting down five mature trees, and the commission said, I don't want you to take, you can't cut down five trees because right now the way it supports the landscape, not necessarily the building too, but it's the landscape and the building as one site, then that's what they say, right? So I think to me, the, the issue is that what was proposed that they looked at previously last year was, you know, a set of plantings and a garden that replaces a garden. So it was a landscape feature for people that had different layers of plantings, different spaces and areas, is now being changed. And so the commission can say, okay, you know, how is that changing? What is the difference between what was approved or reviewed last fall and what's happening now? Is it, well, you know, is it the level of plantings? Is it change in topography? Is it, so what, what is really happening? And so when I, you know, before this meeting, I asked for, you know, a set of plans, right? The existing conditions, what was proposed previously and what is proposed now with clear, clearly marked, you know, changes, whether it's the number of trees or what's happening. So then we can kind of understand what are the changes that are happening. And so that's kind of the purview tonight. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to just say, um, I, I, I do appreciate it. The purview of the Historical Commission has to relate to the historic quality of the building and the land. That's fine. But it would seem to me that the Commission would have to make a determination that what is proposed is deleterious to the historical character of the building or the land. Uh, that's what I understand, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. That's number one. And again, I appreciate your patience. The second thing I want to say is this, the commission made some very interesting comments about the windows and the roof, and um, we think it's important to clarify that uh, removing the bid alternatives on the asphalt shingles um, going out with a, a bid only for the synth synthetic slate, uh, going out for a bid only for the new window sashes, uh, we, we think that's, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. The last thing I wanted to say was, uh, with, with respect to all who are so committed to this project, and, and I mean that, we, we, value, we value its amazing asset to Amherst how committed people are to getting this right. But some things were said that I think are not accurate. And they went to the question of whether or not uh, people in this town hid from the Historical Commission um, documents uh, that should have been provided. It is very clear that that did not happen. The Historic Commission knew of our submission to the Mass Historic in April and August of 2023, you all supported that submission. It's very clear now that there were no letters to be shared with you in advance of uh, no, no determinations by Mass Historic that could have been shared with you in advance of, of the last time that we went through this process. So with that, 
as, as an introduction and again, gratitude for the work that you'll do tonight. I'm going to turn this over to, uh, I guess I'm going to turn it over to Ellen. I'll take it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Austin. Thanks um, to the commission for meeting with us again on such short, short notice. We really appreciate it. So we were under the impression we were going to start with landscape because we went through the architecture piece. Is that is that what folks agree? OK, so Rachel's going to kick it off. Um, and we did add some slides, uh, Nate, that you had asked for. So hopefully it answers the questions. Rachel, you're gonna, who's yes, sharing? You just I'm going, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. If you could give me control or ability to do that, Nate. Thank you. Uh, please try now. I think it should be all set. Yep. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think, Rachel, you were going to dive right in. So I guess let's hop sure. to it. <laughs> um, we have this list at the beginning and at the end also, um, just to help us track what items we're discussing today. Um, I think we left off with questions about the, the Northland entry, which is the also known as the back side of the library between the library and the CVS parking area. And next slide. Um, also just wanted to re um, repeat a little bit of what Austin said about the process that we've gone through so far and where we are in the process in the context of this commission's review with the other boards and commissions in town. Um, the project has been reviewed by town council and was approved for funding. The planning board um, has reviewed this project, both the original bid and the VE changes, and both were approved with conditions. During that process, we, we reviewed the dimensions, the massing, landscaping, utilities, stormwater, life safety, and use. And prior to that meeting, we met with the Amherst Public Shade Tree Committee to review the removal of trees as well as the proposed planting of trees. The design review board, we also reviewed the character of the design with respect to downtown, the materials used, the massing, and the landscaping. Both, both the original bid design and the VE design um, received a letter of risk support with recommendations. Um, we presented to you all the original bid design um, for the demolition and improvements to the landscape, which you approved. And we, we covered last week the VE changes with respect to the demolition um, permit again. And today we're talking about the approval. Um, so, you know, reading, we've read, we've read the preservation restriction many times over. Um, and there are a couple, couple things that seem to focus on the exterior of the building and the landscape. And also there's a phrase uh, that that is on page 38 of that, that talks about um, changes must be reviewed by the grantee, which is the Amherst Historical Commission and their impact to the historic integrity of the property. Um, and the intent of the preservation restriction is to enable the grantee, that is the Amherst Historic Con uh, Commission, to review proposed alterations and assess their impact to the integrity of the building not to pre um, prevent future change. So we're really excited to go over the VE changes with you within that context and, and talk about the next steps. Um, we found from, wait, the library is really helpful. It's great having library as a client because we have this tremendous asset of archives. Um, so the library was able to provide us with some images of the north landscape, the north facade, um, back shortly after its original construction. And you can see that the landscape is very open lawn with um, some shade trees around the periphery. So the image on the left is the view of the back of the library prior to the 1990s edition. You can see it's a much smaller uh, footprint. And then... Um, on the right, you can see the view looking back towards the CVS parking lot area where it's more open um, 
the trees along the border. Um, it's worth noting that the grades in the 1990s edition were significantly altered in this area. Um, the grades were dropped at least three feet along that, that facade of the building. Um, and so the pathways today, which I'll, I'll talk you through in another slide, um, actually cuts into those grades. And there are changes to the building in the 1990s on the facade to adjust the windows and, and other features to tie into that grade change. Next slide. Um, these are some images from the site I, earlier in the year. Um, the image at the, on the top of the page is the view from the CVS parking lot looking towards that north facade. Um, you can see, and if you, if you walk back there, you, you can measure um, that the grades are about three to three and a half feet below the adjacent the gr grades at the property boundary. So they, they cut in a pathway into the land with access to the north. We heard feedback as we were working through this process that the, the back area does not feel safe, that sight lines are really poor to the back entry, and many residents use this property as a walkthrough to Amity Street from the CVS lot. So anything that could be done to kind of open up sight lines and increase visibility would, would be helpful. Next slide. Um, I should also mention, if we go back, um, in 1999, uh, the Kenzie Garden was designed and installed in that in that garden. So what you're seeing here are many of the plantings uh, associated with the Kenzie Garden. Uh, most of them were centered along that island area, um, the area between the path and the historical society property to the right of the image, and then foundation planting along um, the back of that north facade. During this process, the Kestrel Land Trust has received, they transplanted the Kinsey Garden um, and to their South Amherst location. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is an existing conditions of enlargement of that area. Um, you can see at the top of the page the, the, where the pathway meets the CVS parking lot um, and the island in between with the mature trees and then the pathway, how it bends around the wall to get to that north entry. Um, so the image on the right is the same plan with a little bit more um, diagram for helping understand what's going to happen on site. Um, so the proposed addition, we're actually going to you know, extend into the property a little bit more, um, and we're impacting one of the large shade trees in that island that we'd need to remove. We reviewed it with the tree warden and with the public shade tree committee um, and it's believed that that tree would not would be really expensive to try to save and would not would not survive um, the construction of the addition. That tree also is growing into the sewer, the clay tile sewer pipe. Um, so that tree needs to go. Can um, we just annotate the drawing with what's being removed? Sure. Thanks. Um, so anything with the orange circles are being removed. And they also have the little X's. So that would be the tree that I was just referring to is this tree. Um, this tree here um, will be removed to, for the regrading for the stormwater storage on site, um, as will this one. This tree here will be removed um, for its proximity to the wall and the regrading on the site. Uh, and this tree was removed at the request of the Historical Society as it is growing into the library currently. Um, the contractor will be required to plant another tree on the Historical Society property in replacement. So we're able to retain these existing maple trees here um, and, this, and this tree here. Um, and we are protecting this large ash tree here. Can you, what are the kinds, what uh, species, sorry, can we just go through that again? The species of trees that are being removed? Um, this is a, this is a, a river birch. This, um, this is, I believe, an oak. Um, and I, I, I don't recall now if this is an oak or a maple, but these are, those are the general, they're large shade trees. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
the next slide. And this is a side-by-side -side comparison um, to help, help compare what we had in our original bid versus what we're proposing now. Um, I should, again, emphasize that the there, there is no change with the tree plan between the original bid and the VE plan. So uh, we still plan to plant um, additional trees on site in the same locations. So those would be um, these, these two swamp white oaks here and a sassafras here, and then fringe trees, which is an understory flowering tree right at the border of CBS. Um, we will be protecting, we'll be protecting these existing trees with pretty extensive um, tree protection fencing and air spading of roots. Okay. Um, so then on the ground, the with the paved surfaces, um, all the all the paved areas are similar. Uh, um, prior, you know, we have this direct pathway from the CBS lot to the north entry to help with that good visual sight line and safety. Um, and then we have another uh, diagonal walkway um, going to the east side of the libraries for all those folks who are using the library as a pass through. And one of the things that we're really excited about this project is that we were able to make the entire site entirely accessible so someone could. Um, and have a much easier time navigating from the CVS lot up the east side of the building where it's very steep now. Um, before with the um, with the areas too, we have we had in the original bid some of the like cafe tables, um, their movable chairs and tables. We have pulled that out of the bid, um, but it's something that the library could bring back uh, as funds allow. And the same, we've also removed the um, Goshen stone bench that separates the patio area from the garden area. And again, that's something that could be built at a later point as funds allow. Um, with the site grading and stormwater, um, before we had one, one depression in the area in the back that was about two and a half to three feet down. And I have some sections to talk you through that. Um, but it's an area that gathers the water that's coming off the Historical Society property that's coming in this way. Um, it's coming in this way. And then underneath, we, we called it the stormwater sandwich. So underneath we have subsurface infiltration structures that are taking water from the roof and paving surfaces. Um, so with that, then we had before uh, actual little bridges that crossed, that crossed the, the rain garden area um, the bridges were very expensive, and so um, we were able to reconfigure the stormwater design to be able to still receive the water coming up the historical society property, still receive the water from the roof, um, and provide um, three smaller, um, smaller depressions in the garden area to deal with the stormwater. Um, that saved money out front and that saved money in the in the, this back area. But we were still able to, re to retain the Goshen Stone stepping paths that we are reusing Goshen Stone from the site for. Um, and we've gotten feedback early in the process that the garden area needed to have areas to sit um, rather than just be a pass through. So we still have the boulder seating um, and a couple of granite benches reclaimed from the site. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So these are some, these are cross sections, you know, as if, if you could think of the North Garden as a piece of cake and, or a full cake, and you want to slice through it and see what, what, how it's, how it's put together. Um, we, these are cross sections cutting through through to show the relationship of the path, path to the depressions. Um, so in the original bid, we again had an elevated um, crossing of the depression, and this this was one continuous depression area. Um, and now in this process, we have one, two, and not on this section, but we've got um, we have a second a second depression. Um, okay, next slide. Um, 
these are side-by-side -side views of what it might be like to be back there. Um, this is the view from the CVS parking lot looking towards that new north entry. As you can see, we have really good sight lines to that north entry. Um, and on the left, you can see the original uh, rain garden bridges and the Goshen stone bench, um, the sassafras tree, the ash tree, um, and the various textures of planting in the rain garden along with the stepping stones. The image on the right shows our BE option, where we've deferred that Goshen stone bench till later. Um, the rain garden bridges are now replaced with continuous sidewalks. And then the stepping stone paths and seating areas remain. Um, but they are, the, the more robust planting areas are replaced with a, a very soft, um, loose um, fescue called Nomo fescue. It grows to about 18 inches high and flops over and makes these little waves in the landscape, kind of what you see in this image. Um, it's something that's a really sustainable alternative to lawn and the fact that you can um, mow it only once a year if you want, if you want to take the little seed heads off of it. Um, it's, also, it's also a fescue that if you decided that you wanted to mow it, you can mow it to like a four inch height. Um, but our intent would be that the library would not mow it and it would um, reduce the carbon footprint of the library for sure. It's also something that over time you could plant minor bulbs like the image on the left into. Um, and it's also an area that over time the library could um, could start to plant areas of the original design and, and fill it with more planting. But it does it does interestingly look more akin to the original um, original landscape of the 1930s. Next slide. Another BE item. Um, originally, we had the the retain wall that at the boundary line between the historical society property and the library property. Um, the top of the wall has a railing, which is important to prevent falling. Um, the the wall is the highest, about uh, four and a half feet at the corner, um, and down to about six inches at its base. So anytime we're over 30 inches, we really want to make sure we have a railing to pe keep people from falling. Um, this railing is an ornamental rail, um, kind of fitting with the character of, of the area. Um, the bottom part of the wall uh, in their original bed was, had a veneer. So the front surface of it was a granite veneer block. Um, in our value engineered option, we are going to go with a concrete base um, with a color add mix, which is kind of like the image to the second from the right there. Um, there are lots of options with grays, different tones of grays, um, but with the thought that over time that if, um, if the library was interested that we could um, work with the local artist or local artist groups to have a mural um, painted with the wall. Okay, next slide. Um, and that that's the summary of I think of the landscape changes. Okay, thank you. And thanks for attending tonight. I know there, you had a conflict, Rachel. Okay. Uh, let's see. Nate, was that the only pr presentation we requested for this evening? Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we can, the one from last week is still available online or they may have it as well, but for now it's just focusing on the landscape. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thanks. I think we can, let's see, do we have any, while we have the, the presentation up, do we have any questions about um, what we were just shown among the commissioners? No, that was pretty clear. Um, mm -hmm. I have one question. <clears throat> in the detention areas, can you tell explain how deep they are, and then if the overflow grates are will be visible, or what kind of structure is in the middle there? If it's like an act grade, if it's a. Sure, Josephine, do you mind um, going back to the side by side plan? Yeah, they're um, they're down so. Elevation around three three fourteen. It varies where you are in the basin, but the the lowest point is around three fourteen, and the sidewalk is 
varies from 316 to 317. Um, so the it's it doesn't exceed more than more than 30 inches at any point. Um, it's obviously deeper in the middle, but then shallow sides on the sides. Um, the three structures on the on the right. Um, it's okay. Um, currently, they are proposed as yard drains. Um, we typically would use an ornamental cover in this type of application, um, and they they are at grade with ground. Okay, I think we don't have any questions. So um, thank you for this. Um, oh, I was, um, is there a possibility to introduce, so looking at this drawing actually, the plantings on the left. Um, is there a possibility to introduce those plantings at a later point or you're, you say maybe just bulbs would be um, a possibility to sort of add color to the to the detention basins? Yeah, so the 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 design of the planting is a is a pattern is a, a shape form that's independent of the topography and we actually were really excited about how the different forms might interact with your experience on site. Um, it is a pattern that could be applied to this, this layout and this design easily, um, especially given that the, um, the Goshen stone pathways are already there, all of that hard, all that hardscape, which would be harder to um, put in at a later date with a lot of, you know, a lot of work. Um, it is quite possible to, uh, to take away the NOMO or interplant with the NOMO going forward. Um, okay. Even with those sort of de detention basin engineering underneath yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So on the left, on the original, you know, there's a few different colors for the ground. Is that just all a ground cover or is there anything else like a flowering shrubs or anything there? Or is it all just more like a ground cover? Um, we have quite a mix. So we use the color to help keep us from going crazy. Um, we have, uh, we had a mix of purples, purples and whites. That is this purple color. So we had um, um, mixtures of, of different, different um, plants in that area. Um, we had a mix of acetums and mosses and some of the same fescue that's in the snowmo mix. We incorporated around the stepping stones paths. Um, we had a, a mix of yellows, we had a mix of reds. I think that we did have um, some taller plants in this, this orange area here on the side. Again, kind of having a little bit of a backdrop, but we were trying to avoid um, specifically shrubs because um, we've heard we've he heard the struggles that the library has had with um, people using shrubbery for storage of personal goods. So Rachel, the previous plan did not have shrubs in this area. Right. Right. I, I think I, I like the the real intentionality to the original drawing that it just it does demonstrate to passers by that this is a cared for space um because they're they're does tend to be those issues at the rear of the library of kind of people might mistake in an area that's a no mow or a low maintenance sort of landscape as a a place with no oversight or right but um i it sounds like you've already addressed these issues with the sight lines and the what is remaining are these um the goshen pathways and um the sight lines are are really important too. Mm -hmm. 
So shall we just um, move on to a, I guess we can move on to public comment then if there's no more questions from the commissioners regarding the presentation. No. Madeline, okay. Madeline, yeah. Is, yeah. It, is it possible to say something related to what Austin Surratt began um, the presentations with? Yes. Because I, I was a little confused by his question to the commission. We're we're not we're not looking to try and hold on to a particular time period where this building is more preserved or less preserved. We're being asked to apply the standards, and I just wanted to have that in for the record. Thank you. Yeah, I think this concept of um, our we that that we are evaluating the impacts to the integrity of the building, the landscapes impact the integrity of the building is is interesting because that does in, include materials and changes at sight lines and things that might distract from from the historic integrity of of the building. It doesn't mean that we have to um, replicate the original as closely as possible um, in this in this context. So Madeline, may I just say I, I must have introduced a confusion because what you've just said is my understanding that your review is to look at what we are doing in terms of the historical integrity of the property. That's all I was trying to say. It's this is not the design review committee where we went through and they look and they make an aesthetic judgment. So what you've said is what I was hoping would be said, that what what you are doing, what we're happy to have you do, we're glad to have you do, is to look at this and make a determination. Does this detract in any way from the historic integrity of the building? So that's all I was trying to say. My reference to the past was simply to say, if you look at the history of the landscape, you see that what we're doing is more in common with what was there at the beginning. But I appreciate your clarification. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I think we should move on to public comment um, because I think uh, there's many people who want to make their comments heard. So um, we will ask then uh, for members of the public who wish to, to speak to raise their hand in advance now, um, just so that we have an understanding of how many how many people um, we will be hearing from this evening. And we are going to try and keep this hearing as close to 9.30 as possible, um, even though we all have snacks and water. Um, okay. All right, and as uh, last time, we'll limit um, comments to two minutes, please. Okay. Sure, Cameron, you can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, hello, actually, uh, this is Carol Gray. My, my son changed the name when he was using my phone once, so sorry, it shows up as Cameron. Uh, A15 Southeast Street. Um, so thank you for your service. Um, I would like to say several things. One is I mentioned at the last public hearing that it was I had heard that one of the commissioners is a former student or maybe current student of Austin Surratt's. If that's the case, that's a conflict that must be disclosed according to the law. Um, so if that is the case, that really needs to happen um, at the start of the hearing, really, um, and filed with the town clerk by law. Um, I'd also raise a concern about um, Nate Malloy's uh, interjections at the last meeting. Uh, it seemed to me that he was playing a role as a commissioner. He was often giving his personal opinion about how the commissioners should vote. Sometimes commissioners were raising concerns and he was redirecting their concerns to instead talk about the wall or various other aspects of the project. I think the town staff should be 
only giving uh, their professional advice when commissioners are asked for it and should not be as acting as a commissioner. Neither should the applicant be weighing in as a commissioner, chirping in when it's not the time for the presentation. Um, in terms of the standards, I'd ask you all to have a lot of courage. And I'm asking you this because you've all read by now the, the two page memo from the Massachusetts Historic Commission saying that five of the standards that you must legally follow are being violated. And the, uh, the Preservation Restriction Agreement of Amherst says in two different places that the standards to be applied in interpreting this town agreement are the standards that have were already seen as violated by the Massachusetts Historic Commission. Nate Malloy said previously, well, you don't have to do what the Mass Historic Commission did. Well, that's true. However, you do have to follow the law. And the Mass Historic Commission was very clear laying out the five standards that are being violated here. And you're not free to ignore the law. If you decide that somehow you think they're completely wrong on their legal interpretation, then you should issue a similar memo saying, we think that all standards are being met and here's why. And we think that the Mass Historic Commission is wrong when they say that these five standards are being met. But I think that deep in your gut, probably you know that these standards are being violated. And I'm asking you to have courage because if they're being violated, if even one of them is being violated, you have a legal duty to say that this project does not comply with the preservation restriction agreement for the town of Amherst. And you can't rewrite the project. It's not up to you to say, well, the project's good, but switch to real shingle, re the real slate shingles instead of asphalt. You're not the construction people. You're not the, the project advisors. Your job is to take the project as it's presented to you today and say if it violates the preservation restriction agreement. And if you find that any one of those standards that the Mass Historic Commission that's very experienced in applying these standards says are being violated, you, you really have no choice but to make a motion saying we find that this project violates one or more <laughs> standards of the preservation restriction agreement. I ask you to have courage. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Jeff, you can unmute yourself. Thanks, yeah, this is Jeff Lee. I live in South Amherst. And um, regardless of the intention of whether to hide the uh, letters from the Mass Historic Commission or not, the fact is that they just were not made public. They were not put in any meeting packets, no historical commission packets, no trustees packets, no JLBC packets, no town council packets until this hearing tonight, or actually last last week's uh, or the other night. Anyway, uh, I've read closely those letters from Brona Simon, and I think there are nine changes that you ought to insist on to the design that will help uh, rectify the design and um, mitigate the adverse effects. I'll read those off. One, you should eliminate the new addition that covers overwhelms and clashes with this historic building. They mentioned that clearly. Two, you should require the historic roof to be replaced with its original material, Buckingham slate. Three, you should prohib prohibit the removal or moving of interior walls and millwork. That was the essence of the original design by Alan Cox. Four, you should keep original stairways intact as the MHC. Uh, commented. Five, you should require replacement of original windows with historically compatible double or triple pane sashes for sustainability. Six, you should prohibit the unnecessary demolition of the 1993 edition that will impact adjacent walls of the 1927-28 historic building. The Histo Mass Historical Commission mentioned that. Seven, you should maintain the historic Whipple window as a functional exterior window. Eight, you should preserve the original director's office. And nine, you should disallow cutting a hole in the stonework of the original building's main facade for a book drop, which appears to be no longer needed. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Uh, Elisa, you can talk. Hi, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all the work everybody's doing on this. It seems to me that when an historic building is no longer serving its purpose and needs to be modified, that we want to make it possible for the building to better serve us now in the present and into the future. This is a library. I think many of the changes that are proposed are going to make it a significantly more functional library and make for genuine handicapped accessibility, which we don't have now. So I really hope that the project can move ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hilda, you can unmute yourself. I want to ask a question about maintenance, particularly about the new landscape plan. One of the big problems with the way the Jones look now is the, all of the deferred maintenance, both in cutting out the trees, which have allowed window and other woodwork to deteriorate because the trees are too close to the building. And that happens to be one of the comments that Eric Gredoya made in the structural report. And then the other thing about all the changes in the landscape, how much how much maintenance is that going to require in order not to look like a weed patch? I'm just bringing that up because you've got a much bigger building than you had before and you couldn't maintain what you had or there wasn't the will to maintain what you had. And I don't know what kind of power you have in, in deciding what the landscape should look like, but it should look good whether it's going to be manicured every week or whether it goes a whole season with weeds filling up the purple and the pink flower gardens. I just want to make that point that deferred maintenance has had taken its toll on the building and the grounds, especially on the Amity Street side. And when you make a decision, keep that in mind, that that's not been a strong point of the staff. Thank you. Thank you for making that comment. Hi, Maria, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. I think we've very well established that information was withheld from you that would have been very helpful for you to do your job. Um, in addition to not telling you the findings from the Mass Historic Commission, you were also not notified that the application was incomplete and if information was being received during these meetings. The uh, other thing, I, I hope you read the letter that, that I sent you. I also want to let you know one other thing, which is um, uh, uh, to review this, that the, the library director knew that the MHC review was in progress, right? And they didn't send it. They didn't send that to you. Also, what was in your packet for your September 14th meeting in 2023 included a document which just has some frankly untrue statements. And it was put in there as information for you to digest. It said that the new edition utilizes a compatible material palette and does not exceed the height of the original building. It said that there were minor removal and reconfiguration. Uh, there was minor re removal and reconfiguration planned for the interior. Um, I mean, you were, you were suffering under lack of information and erroneous information back in the fall. And you really need to make this right now. You need to apply the standards, the 10 standards, you should go through those and you should do your job there. I also just wanna share with you just the, some things I've heard, you know that this is being talked about in the community. I spoke with a, a younger woman and probably her young to me in her late twenties, who was just horrified about what was being proposed to be done to the historic Jones. She, she couldn't believe it. Um, she knew about it and she still couldn't believe it. 
I also want to share with you the story of a, an older woman who told me about her dad, who had been involved in the building of the 1928 Jones. And I spoke with her and I spoke with four generations of that family. So when we're talking about historic preservation, we're talking about the building, we're also talking about the people in town. Okay, so you guys have a duty to historic preservation. Please meet that duty. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Jenny, you can unmute yourself. Hi, this is Jenny Hamilton. I live on Middle Street in South Amherst, and I, I wear two hats in this process. So disclosing that I am paid by the Friends of the Jones Library to manage the capital campaign um, doing the fundraising for this project. Um, so as in both roles, I thank you for your time and your attention to this. Um, I, I look at what is being offered, and, and that's to everyone on the screen. I look at the hard work that the architects and landscape crew have done um, to keep the integrity of our building, keep the building, the beauty of our building and its property um, uh, by offering an opportunity that will be hopefully um, more affordable and able to move forward. Um, in specific examples, the removal of the roof monitor makes the addition less visible, visible from Amity Street, which should be a boon from the historic preservation standpoint. Similarly, having the alternate to retain the original windows keeps more historic fabric. Um, and if we hadn't seen the beautiful color planting plans that, that Rachel and Jess designed, you know, seeing trees preserved that are healthy, seeing additional trees saved, seeing a, um, historic stone benches retained, um, those new designs are, are beautiful as well. Um, the, cent the, the library is part of the Central Amherst Historic District. And for the purpose of that district, making a fully accessible building, creating safer sight lines and keeping our beautiful stone library um, healthy and, and protected will benefit the downtown district and benefit our town as a whole. Um, a last point I will make with my professional hat on as somebody who's been very actively involved for the past three years in raising these funds is that the tax credit review for tax credit funding is a very different process than the historic preservation review under the federal review or under what you all are doing at, at the local devil. It's got different standards. Yes, that it's the same federal listing, but there's a, it's a whole, it's a very different thing. So comparing what you all are needing to do and what um, folks at Mass Historic had to do for tax credits are, are, are quite different. Um, and I will close by saying with all of these historic preservation efforts, with all of the necessity for our federal and state funding, um, those of us involved in the library renovation and expansion are putting preservation at the, the top of that list. We worked incredibly hard to secure the, those federal funding grants and, and other possibilities, and we will not do anything to jeopardize them. So we are working closely with all the officials involved to make sure that, that what we're doing is um, in accordance with the, with the laws and regulations. So thank you all for your service and for being here yet again. All of us wish we could already be doing the um, the construction at this point, um, but appreciate you coming back um, and taking this time. Thank you for that comment. Christopher, you can unmute yourself. Well, hi, it's Mickey Rathbun. Um, yes. Uh, I would like to make a couple of points. Um, just first, I've got to say this. Um, several people have said that since the plants that were in the Kinsey uh, garden that Carol Pope uh, planted in memory of her husband, uh, the fact that those plants 
have been moved with the help of the Garden Club and et cetera. The fact that those have been moved to the site of the new Kestrel headquarters, that, that's completely irrelevant. I mean, the fact is that the garden was removed from the Jones Library site. I mean, I just have to say that um, this sort of, oh, but the plants are fine. They're now at Kestrel. You know, that's such a bogus argument and um, it just, it just, annoys me. Um, what Ms. Hamilton just said about the fact that the uh, Mass Historic Commission's considerations with respect to the historic cat, uh, tax credits, that they're using different standards from the standards that um, the federal government would apply, NEH or, or HUD, that's just not true. They're the same standards. And I don't know why uh, she says that. It just I feel like there's so much disinformation that is shoveled out, um, is distressing. Um, I also have to say that the professional fundraiser, Matt Blumenfeld, has behaved deplorably. And the, the email letter that he sent to Sarah McKee was just beyond the pale. I mean, it was juvenile. It was insulting. I cannot believe that he is still on the payroll. And, and I just think that the fact that he hasn't been summarily fired is just speaks volumes about how this project is being uh, pushed down the town's throat. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Arlie, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Arlie Gould, South Amherst. Um, I just want to say you are the historical commission, and your job is to, you know, deal with the preservation restriction agreement. So all these comments about the future and all of this is, you know, nice, but that's not really what's going on here. What's going on here is to decide whether or not this project is uh, violating the preservation restriction agreement um, and also to deal with the um, historic preservation standards. And in thinking about this, I do find it interesting that the preservation restriction agreement talks about the exterior of the building, the landscaping, but not about the interior. But the standards are for both the interior and the exterior. So a little bit, um, you know, to say there were no adverse effects in the fall well, maybe on the interior, that was with, you know, the preservation restriction agreement, you don't have to talk about the interiors. But in terms of historic preservation, there were adverse effects. So this is a little confusing. Um, and difference of opinion, Mr. Malloy said at the last meeting, difference of opinion from the Mass Historic Commission. Amherst Historic Commission said zero adverse effects. Max Commission said five. You know, if they had said one and you said zero, that maybe is a difference of opinion. But five to zero, you know, there's something else going on there. The last thing I'll say, the reason to take these letters seriously, they have so many more resources than this Historical Commission. They have staffs with you know, professionals. This is a group with varying levels of expertise about historical uh, preservation. Rona Simon apparently has been there for decades. They see the whole state when they're working. So this is like your older cousin who has a lot of experience and information. For this reason, you know, looking at that two-page memo is something I think as a historical commission, 
it would be interesting to you, given that you didn't have this information, as Mr. Surratt said, and for whatever reasons, but you didn't have the information, and now you do. So, you know, it's up to you what you want to revisit and stuff, but I would think that this would be interesting to you as a historical commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal, Sunset Avenue. And I wanna thank you for spending so much time on this matter. I just want to um, make two points that I've sent to you in writing and that you may have found in your packet. One is you have every right to consider or reconsider the entire project. Chair Sarrett agrees that you did not see letters from the State Commission before your major decision last fall. Every judicial or, or quasi-judicial body, which you are, must react when new information not given to you earlier comes to your attention. You can, in fact, you must recognize it. That's true provided there has been no reliance to the contrary, and here there hasn't been because no contract has been approved, no construction has been undertaken. And two, even if, as in this case, the consultants have given you only a few items to consider, you can consider other things. I just want to cite as an example the now almost infamous hole cut into the front wall near the front door for what is now a non-existent automated book sorter. Value engineering has not deleted it. You can require that they do so. And in fact, in the future, if there ever is an automated book sorter, the hold can be put in then. And the other fact is that an automated book sorter in the future may require a hole in a slightly different place. So because they haven't suggested that it be taken out, you can do that. And you can look at other things, too, that they haven't brought to your attention. Thank you for listening to me and to the others who are speaking tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Letitia. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, first say I admire your patience. Um, all of you who are actually on the Historic Commission, um, as various lawyers try to twist the facts here, um, I just remind you that 65% of the voters in Amherst supported this project, um, so it's not exactly being rammed down anybody's throat. Um, and as for the false accusation um, that uh, information was withheld from the Commission, um, who shares information about an application that was unsuccessful? Um, these are very, the mass uh, historical tax credits is a very highly competitive process. There are many people competing for it and not all of the um, applications go through. So the criteria are very high. That does not mean that this project is not a worthy project. Um, I walk between the Jones and the CVS parking lot quite a bit. Um, this was not a great area, even when the private Kinsey Garden was there. Um, and I really welcome the greater visibility that the new design brings. Um, and as I said last week, I really like the no mow um, aspect and the fact that there are no shrubs here, which is for a very good reason, as Rachel explained very nicely again today. Um, finally, I would urge um, the commission to focus on, a, to keep their focus on the specific issues they are asked to address tonight which are the VE aspects, the things that are different from the original plan that they approved. Um, the accessibility aspects that this new um, uh, grading allows, the new um, uh, landscaping allows, I think is actually really, really important. And I hope people will not um, forget about that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any more hands raised? Let's see. Anybody else? Nope. Oh. 
Okay. So we'll move on to um, our discussion um, part of the hearing. Um, we're going to deliberate among commissioners with um, staff input. So I ask applicants to refrain from making comments unless we have a question directed to you. Um, but thank you for, thanks for being here for that. Um, right. So how, does anybody have any comments to start us off from the commissioners? I think the changes to the landscaping have been thoughtful. I think they allow for future um, enhancement. But I think the visibility lines, I think the lighting that we heard about in a previous meeting um, are, are, are um, welcome. But I can appreciate that if we're looking at preserving the building, that this is an area that can be with with funding available um, improved in a, it, more, to bring it more to the original plan. But the plan as presented tonight appears to me to be um, thoughtful and acceptable. Yeah, I would um, concur with Pat. I would say looking at what our duty is at looking at the historical building and also the character of its location and context, um, especially looking at the improvements in relation to our previous um, meeting, um, especially the NOMO allows for also flexibility um, to and a, a build off point um, that I think it keeps in character. So Madeline, um, I'd love to talk about accessibility because a number of people in public comment um, have mentioned universal access accessibility, which is a really important thing we should be thinking about in our town and in especially in our downtown. Um, right now we have still on the drawings an opening on the right hand side of the front entrance for a book drop. I'm very concerned about that. I know it in part related to access issues, universal access issues. Um, I've been told that the book sorting machine is eliminated at this point from the budget. It will not be part of the bidding process that's the case, then the interior woodwork and wall removals that were being discussed a year ago should be moot at this point, M-U-T-E. They should not be a part of any drawing that goes out to bid. I'm very, I want to be very clear about that. I, I will chime in with Hetty. I know we're looking at landscaping. Yeah, uh, And I'm not sure at what point in this meeting we should bring up other topics. Well, but I, about accessibility, Pat, which is actually what right. the presentation was about. It, it was in part, but it was also, with the book sorting, it was in part about more efficiency for the library staff. However, I agree with you, the accessibility is the primary thing. But I, I think that... Um, it, it, I do need to weigh in because I had some points that I wanted to raise tonight, and that was primary among them, that I do not think that that should be um, executed um, and break into the wall of the front of the library when the book sorting machine is in the future and, and may be located in an entirely different place. You know, there there is a book drop outside of the sidewalk, but there is a book drop up the, the handicap walk to the kind of annex to the main part of the library. And there is a, a room be, adjacent to that and behind that is very, um, has very little 
usage uh, or or purpose. And so I, I, I pondered since our last meeting things that I was concerned about, the book drop being executed. If we're talking about value engineering, that certainly should figure into not doing the book drop, mm -hmm. not at this time and in place. The other thing, and this may not be the time and place, but I pondered long and hard because I'm also on the design review board, which together with the historical commission voted that the synthetic asphalt, the synthetic slate was the only alternate choice for the building. But I, I have to tell you, I went into town the other day after our meeting last week with binoculars and I studied the streetscape of the slate roof I'm not a roofing expert. I've roofed a few homes in my time. One of them was a slate roof in, in the state of New York. And that roof looked as though it were somewhat sound. I don't know the history of its evaluation. I don't know the history of leaks. But with my binoculars, I only saw one place where there was a breach in the slate near a dormer. When looking at the building, it's to the left of the entrance. And mm -hmm. so I began to wonder whether it wasn't, get, we weren't given that choice, but I began to wonder whether or not at least the streetscape could be maintained as slate. It's a question. I'm sharing my thoughts with you and I'm not sure this is the time to do it, but I think that's fine. It's now or never. Yeah. Uh, so those, those were two of the things that I felt very strongly about. The third yeah. thing that I feel strongly about, because I have dealt with historic buildings in, in windows, is I think that it will end up costing more to rehab a certain number of windows, existing windows, historic windows, than it would be to replace all of the windows in the 1928 building with um, uh, historically reconstructed windows it right. it um it, it, it's it, i i i you know i i hope that there would be or could be or has been a cost analysis of that but those were the three things after our meeting last week that i pondered and i and i and i felt really strongly that i needed to bring up again because yeah. um they're they're important they're important to our work on this commission well, you know, there's only four of us tonight and I think you can, we can, um, I think we should all just discuss our thoughts really about, you know, what we're thinking after our discussion last week. And I think just, and following, following the hearing last week and just how we want to pursue tonight um, whether we want to go through each of these VE standards, I, um, and how much we want to discuss these MHC letters, because, um, yeah, I was not present in the fall meetings last year. Um, I was on maternity leave, so I find it just, but I, I'm aware of the discussions and I've watched the, the hearings and um, but I just find, I do find it, I, I do take issue with that the Historical Commission was not notified about the MHC letters and this process that was underway. Um, I was, I chaired the discussion of the interiors um, for the interiors in January and I did not know that a letter had been received that stated very clearly um, the MHC's, um, you know, their comments. So, and I, I do find it, I do take issue I've, that the designs have not been changed since then. Um, that there hasn't been a an attempt to adapt or change the designs in response to 
MHC's determination. Um, so if, if we look at the MHC determinations and I and I I I um know that Nate has said that we are are bound by our demolition bylaws because that's and the preservation agreement with the library because that's really what's the background for our discussions. But in looking at the MHC, which we didn't know about until recently, the three things that I mentioned, the the fact that we weren't given an option to at least do a streetscape with slate. I can and and, and or an understanding of why they were going to replace the whole roof. Um, the book drop is now um, not necessary under the present plans. And the windows, I think, are a cost value factor, from my experience. So I, 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 I go on record as saying I think that Amherst needs a community center library. This is not in any way to distract from that. Yeah. But I also think that, that as a member of this commission, these are issues that um, I gave thought to once we had the Mass Historical Commission information and and um, just our own purview of pre preserving um, the historic building without getting in the way of allowing it to have a purpose in the present and the future. Pat, thank you. Um, I think you and I might differ about um, slate roofs. Um, I've had professional experience dealing with a Frank Lloyd Wright building that needed a new roof where there was a lot of pressure to put asphalt shingle on a new roof. I know we're a little bit beyond what Rachel came up with in her presentation. I apologize, Rachel, for it sounds like I've ignored your presentation. I'm not, but this is really important. Um, I think we listen, need to listen to Ellen and Salone has years of experience of dealing with what is actually going on out there in the field and technically with sustainability and with historic preservation. And I think synthetic slate would actually be a pretty good compromise. Um, in fact, I would recommend that if we don't rescind our vote from last year tonight, which I think we might very possibly do in good conscience, we should at very least um, say what it is that we are kind of, what our sort of bottom line is tonight as the commission. And it may differ from one to the other of us. All the more reason to rescind the vote from last year, to take a look at these standards again, and to do what exists as a model in our demolition delay, um, by law, which is to go through each thing one by one. And we could do that with the preservation for the preservation restriction um, agreement. And we could do that with the standards um, and find out where we end up um, at the end of that process. Um, you know, I, I did also go through and listen to those two recordings um, from September and October. Um, I think that represented for me a very important moment in the history of this project because it really showed me that everybody really cares about the Jones and really wants to get something to come to the surface, which is going to, to work for everybody. Um, but now we're a little bit beyond that. We're in this VE realm um, where, you know, value engineering, you, you think that value engineering didn't happen with the 1993 edition? You bet it did. And you bet that FAA has been value engineering all along to try and make this project affordable. That's their job as architects. So I think we would do ourselves and the town and the library and the community um, a favor by getting back down into the weeds, looking at the standards that we discussed, but that we didn't very carefully go through in order, just as we would a demolition bylaw review, and see where we end up. 
Thank you. Patty, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to listen to the arguments for the um, synthetic slate. Right. And, <laughs> and, and I voted for that in a, this meeting, in, in this commission, and also the design review board. I just realized that I didn't have the background review. And, and I also realized that much of what our concern is, is, is historic context and streetscape to maintain that. Um, and so I raise this question, not to stop the process. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think we need to go back and do step by step. I think there are just certain things like the book trap that's, that's superfluous right now. And so if we're talking about value engineering, that should that should count, uh, uh, you know, on on a reduce the cost side. I think um, it's about four hundred thousand dollars. I don't mean to interrupt, but I just yeah. that's the number. I I don't know that number, and so my thought was that we should have that included in the value engineering. And I don't know that we need to go back to December, to September, or, or anywhere, other than to speak our thoughts on either having a better understanding or, or um, you know, you and I are both on board with the, if we're doing value, value engineering, let's get rid of the book drop because it's superfluous right now. And so I, I'm coming from a point of view of these are my thoughts. And you and I agree on the book drop. I don't know what the architects will think about this, but um, I, I don't want to stop the process. I don't want us to go back to September because we've spent a lot of time and thought and have been very careful with this. I'm not really asking to stop the process. I'm asking to apply the standards. And I think there are certain standards that um, are obvious to us. Um, and so we're talking about those tonight. And, and I also you know, would would like to see a cost analysis of new windows versus um, refurbishing the existing ones. Because as I said, I think at the last meeting, we're just kicking this problem down the road because because the windows only last for so long. Well, I don't, I don't think we, well, so I think um, we probably shouldn't be considering the, the costs as a, decision-making factor for us. But I i mean, I think that was what was determined yeah, Madeline, um, you're, last you're, week. You're exactly right about that. And I shouldn't have introduced that. But if we're talking about value engineering, cost I think, is I think, did you, part of that. Did you say that you didn't have a background when you say you don't, you didn't have a background before? Does that mean was that related to our discussion of the MHC comments? We didn't have that. And we also didn't, from the architects, have the reason why they proposed maintaining the windows and the reason why they proposed the synthetic slate. And so I think if we're gonna put things in a historical context, that background could be useful. Great. <clears throat> Antonia? Yeah, I guess in related to the comment about uh, the roofing um, and slate or um, synthetic slate, or um, as originally talked about, um, asphalt, um, I guess in response to one of what Pat said, I remember the, I guess one of the reasons in for me, that's critical um, of understanding and like the material of the roof. And also in a way, the urgency of it is due to, um, I think what was explained to us before on the leakage um, that was happening in the roof. Um, I think it was past September. Um, and I mean, I also could be corrected um, uh, or whether I'd um, found that in my own um, research in the library, but due to that, um, the importance also of when thinking of not only historic like the physical aspect of the building. And also some people have been talking about the interiors, but the physical books and, and also manuscripts and artifacts that are critical um, of understanding historical importance. And so I do think that the roof um, and is also paramount in trying to I mean, save and preserve this historic um, space that 
I is both a community center, but also is this space of physical um, objects of importance to this town. Um, and I guess going back to the materiality, uh, I would say that I think both in, I was, I was looking at comparisons between synthetic and original, and I think it does a quite a good, a, a great job um, at replicating um, what would be from the street um, view, but I also do understand completely um, and respect um, Pat's comment. Yeah, and Antonio, you know, your comments are helpful because I, I'm not sure that I heard that exactly about the leakage when we were considering the only two alternatives. And so thank you for that. Okay. Nate, did you have your hand raised a long time ago? Do you want to speak? I was going to um, recognize Hetty because she had had her hand up and then I don't think she finished her, her thought. Um, this was a while ago. All right. And then, I mean, what I was going to say is that, you know, I spoke with the town attorney again. Um, there had been some discussions about how obligated are we to follow what Mass Historic had done and do we need to enumerate every standard in the preservation restriction as we review it? And that's not necessarily the case, right? So sometimes even the planning board doesn't go through every specific part of their, of their zoning bylaw. If they review something, they might say, you know, it meets the standards and it, it you know, it it's appropriate for site plan review. Uh, you know, there was not a prescriptive outline in the preservation restriction that that's necessary. And the Massachusetts Historical Commission, you know, really had three points that then violated five standards. One was the removal of the slate shingles the removal and lack of visibility of the of the north walls. And then there was some interior stuff. And those three things added up to the five points. And so there's overlapping uh, applicability of those standards to those issues. And when the commission reviewed this last fall, it was a very thorough review. We had asked the applicants to come back with massing models. We asked about visibility from the street. They discussed how you know, different perspectives from it. And it wasn't as if we, ignored the standards it was had been in your pack it had been in the packet and been available for you know a long time leading up to the meeting and so we had preservation briefs about how to apply additions to old buildings and so whether or not we you know discussed them every time there was the part of the presentation it was part of what the applicants were stating right so we looked at the massing we if we're every if we're actually saying that synthetic slate is appropriate now we're still inconsistent with what, what, what Mass Historic thought was a violation. And so a local commission, when using a preservation restriction to review a project, it's typically the local review. It's not Mass Historic that will, um, you know, re enforce or, you know, use a local restriction. It's, it's on the historical commission. And so from the town attorney's perspective, without having done a deep dive, you know, they've seen videos, they've seen this meeting summaries, they've read documents. The commission did a thorough job. And so, you know, is the Mass Historic's letters that came after the fact for a different program really enough to say that what the commission did last fall wasn't a thorough enough job that you have to revisit it? And so, you know, we spent a number of hours talking about the height, the massing, the visibility, the materials, uh, the windows. And so, and the commission came to a conclusion. And I don't think that you know, what Mass Historic provided necessarily means we have to rescind and go back to what the commission had done. And so, you know, the commission had done its due diligence. And so, you know, we asked about materials. We asked about the lifespan of shingles. We, we you know, we, we, you know, there was a pretty big discussion about that. We talked about the windows. We talked about the materials of the addition in terms of, you know, is it, is it different enough? You know, so is it, Cloudboard siding is it shiplap siding, and so there's you know there's a lot of discussions about these aspects of the project that's inherent to what the standards you know how what are being asked of in the standards, and so uh, you know so what Mass Historic did is they said it did violate five standards. Like I said, it was really based on three pieces, and so from last week it was our understanding that most of the facades, although maybe not visible uh, in the way they are now or what they were originally a lot of them will be preserved or they'll be visible with inside the building, inside the addition. And some will be altered, some will be removed, but some was removed from the 90s addition. And so 
you know, I, I feel like the commission understood that in the fall. And I feel like we had a really good explanation last week. And so to me, you know, I'm not sure that there's what Mass Historic said, that there's a removal of a lot of facade. Maybe, maybe they had trouble reading the plans. I mean, so to me, I feel like we understand what parts of the 28 structure are being changed or altered. And so if the commission thinks, well, being, being visible from the interior now as part of, you know, along the stairwell or a part of um, a gallery space or a large space, if that's, you know, that the wall is still intact, if, if that's appropriate, then, you know, that's what we discussed last time, last fall, and what we discussed last week and what was um, clarified. And so I don't necessarily, you know, I don't think that we have to then rescind everything and start all over again because the commission spent time doing it. And, you know, I don't think the commission acted arbitrarily and capricious, right? That's kind of the standard of law. I think the commission went through everything and reviewed the massing, the scale, the materials. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that as the, right, we kind of understood that this project would be reviewed by MHC and that there would be a respect for MHC's kind of um, response and their recommendations, but the design never was changed after yeah. that, really. It be in the and midst. it's, so I, I feel like, yeah, a little disappointed there. I don't think, I do think that it was, a, that we did perform a thorough um, deliberation in the fall and I wasn't there I wasn't part of it I I couldn't have been but that doesn't mean it it wasn't valid it it, it happened um and we will yeah so Madeline and and Nate and everybody um I don't my comments do not intend to hearken us back to begin again my comments are apples and oranges. More that that we're talking about value engineering. And so Hetty and I agree, the book drop should go. If we're talking about value engineering, that should free up funds to do other important things relative to the design. Um, I accept, if that's the case, the architect's decision that the roof is beyond reclaiming. But we were very clear that the only alternative would be asphalt shingles, uh, not asphalt, um, um, synthetic a slate. I just questioned whether or not the slate could be preserved at the streetscape. Um, and aside from that, I, I feel as though we have do, do, done due diligence. Um, within our purview. And so um, I think we should move forward, but I just felt yeah. this evening I needed to make these comments. Right, and Hetty? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the people who are in my mind right now are all the women who were around at the turn of the century or even before defending and preserving historic buildings in America, founding Rhode Island's Historic Preservation Commission, Antoinette Downing, taking care of Benefit Street near RISD, where I used to teach. <laughs> um, I, I want to do what they would have done. I want to take care of this building. And it seems to me the tools and the instrument to take care of this building in the best possible way, and quite a lot of money is actually dependent on the, the sort of infrastructure around our partnership with the MHC is to, is to work with them. You know? Yeah. Just like the library trustees are working with the, what's it called? The Massachusetts Building Library Building Commissioners who are caring for the Commonwealth and telling us that the Jones Library has got to be changed because it will be a, bill, a library for the Commonwealth. Well, my partners in this as a historical, as a historical commission member are with the MHC, 
with the Secretary of Interior Standards 106. And that's my background. That's why when I did a Frank Lloyd Wright house roof, we didn't put an asphalt shingle roof back on it. The Zimmermans had put it on themselves because they couldn't afford to put a tile roof back on, but we did it. The museum invested in that. And, you know, I, I just, I, I need to feel like I'm guided by my elders and betters. That's what I, that's what I, that's what I wrote to you about, Nate, you know, and, and to Paul as well. Those are the people that I'm working with, <laughs> as well as all of you, you know, and there've been moments in this project where, um, especially around accessibility, the front door, when Marty Smith, you know, helped us figure out what was going to be needed to be done to raise the, the um, pilaster on one side, you know, that, that all, that all made really good sense to me to have those kinds of conversations. We can have those in the context of the, of the standards. Thank you. Yeah, so, I mean, we wrote letters for the MHC um, in support of their tax credit, or sorry, we wrote letters to the MHC in support of the tax credit application. And we we were told by the library that MHC had not really found any issues at that point. Um, so we wrote a letter in support of the exterior changes and then one in support of the interior changes. Um, And the MHC is our state like body that, and we respect their opinions highly. It, I would not want it to be perceived that we were disregarding their comments. Um, but I think we weren't allowed, we weren't um, granted that opportunity to incorporate those comments into our findings earlier, even though we, we did have a thorough hearing amongst ourselves and we are a commission of volunteer members um so the comments and deliberation from mhc would have been you know really valuable for us um and i i think we're all in support of an accessible thriving updated library and it doesn't have to be in um it doesn't mean we can't respect the building's historic fabric and celebrate um, its part and our it, it, of our history and um, its function as a public good. Um, so, yeah. But I think, yeah. I mean, as Pat said, I, I think we can just continue to discuss the what what is on hand today, um, which with these value engineering changes. So, I mean, I think that we are in agreement with the synthetic slate unless Hedy or, I think Antonia made a good point that there was a, um, an issue with the actual like integrity, the physical integrity of the, the roof that it has to be repaired. I mean, Ellen, is that, are you raising your hand to address something? Oh, you're unmuted. Madeline, I don't want to speak out of turn, so I just was asking permission. Do we, will we get a chance to say anything or not? I, I don't want to, you know, get anybody uh, in trouble or anything, but we, we do have a couple of comments we'd like to share, but if it can't be shared, we understand. Sure, we can, yes, you're able, yeah, you can share your comments. Okay, so one thing um, I just, because Sharon's not here, she's on a well-deserved vacation. The, the, the book drop in the front of the building, it's, it's won't be that expensive, It'll, it's a few thousand dollars. Uh, the reason that it's there is because it's at the front entry of the building and it's, it's, it's easier 
for somebody who needs to, it, it, the book drop should be by the front of the building. So when you're going in, you drop the book or the, it's off hours, you can drop the book. Um, that's why it's located there. In the future, the idea is they will have money for books to order. So we'll be set up for that. Um, so I just wanted to say, say that. And the other thing about the north, the north facade, and we, we have a couple of slides if anybody um, is interested. In the 1990s, it was significantly changed, significantly. Is, is, um, Rachel made a, a point of saying that the grade was dropped three feet. All of the windows were dropped and, it, and they took all the white paint off. So this building at one point was all white, right? So in the 90s, they took the white paint off the, the north and the west. Right, so it's significant changes that were done then. So the the north facade we see today isn't original; it was modified. And those are the those are the points I wanted to make. And if anybody wants to see that a slide of that, we we do we do have it. Thank you, and Madeline. I I said something at the beginning of the meeting that I'm sorry I didn't emphasize enough. We are prepared to do what Pat and uh, has recommended about the windows. So replace the windows, new sashes, historically appropriate. We are prepared to remove the asphalt shingle as, um, as a bid alternative. So in terms of the windows and the synthetic, synth synthetic slate, we're all, we're all good to go with that. Thank you, Austin. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to just consider, um, the mature trees that will be removed. Um, I think the landscaping, I think we're, we're pretty much in agreement that the landscaping, um, we don't find issue with, with the landscaping changes I, aside from maybe I am. I think there's justification for mature trees being removed, um, but can we just go, just seems like I'm a little bit unsure about what what those trees look like now, like how big they are and how much it's it's really gonna change at the in the rear. Is there a photo of kind of what those trees look like, like how big they are, how tall they are? Yeah, and in our the presentation we had tonight, there's a, a view from CBS that, that might help illustrate that point. You gonna bring that up, Josephine? Yes. Just okay. give me one second okay. to pull that. Thank you. Right on. Yeah, um, so there are there are two large shade trees in this view that we can. They're very tall. Um, this is the best view, Rachel, right? Yeah, we have this is the view. Thank you. Um, this is this is so this is a view as if you were standing here at the CVS lot looking this way. Mm -hmm. um, so the first tree in view is is this tree here um and the second tree here is this tree tree here um i believe this tree is this tree here um, okay and those are also visible from amity the rear um let's see 
I don't not at least not at least from this view. This tree here is on the side. Um, I mean that second photo. Oh, you mean over here? Right. Okay. Just to jump in quickly, are the two trees in the island being removed? So the two right in the yes, yeah. yes, this one and this one, and that's due to the grading um, and the accessible pathway. So we have you know, a new pathway this way, a new pathway that way. Um, and also is related to the grading for the stormwater. But those are not the those are not the trees that you described as sort of um, threatening the this sort of what some sort of walls. Yes. That are, right. Yeah. This, the the addition, approximately out to here, um, and then there's existing sewer pipe that goes out through the fire department alleyway, I mean, like you climb the alleyway parking lot, um, that, that has roots grown into it. So this tree is not possible to save. Um, okay. This tree is up high. So it's three feet higher than the existing sidewalk level. And we're gonna be dropping the grades down for that shallow basin area. So we're gonna be um, significantly changing the grades in this area, so we're not able to save that tree. We are planting shade trees that have been reviewed by the Public Shade Tree Committee and that are adapted to climate change. So we're looking at lo looking at the future also and um, choosing plants that can handle the increased heat, the increased drought. Um, increased conditions. Right. And do you have an image, sorry, Rachel, of the tree in the northwest corner? So the one close to the, the other shade tree in the corner? One. So it's like, you know, it's off to the right on the top image. Um, I don't, I don't believe in this presentation. No, um, I did go out and look at it after our last meeting. Um, it does have a good canopy. It has a lot of, it has several widow makers. Those are like large limbs um, that look, appear to be dead. Um, and the truck several feet up from the ground had significant scarring. Um, something that an arborist would, would, we, we definitely would want to look at if that were, if that were to stay on site. Um, it, it may be, it may be a hazard um, regardless of what happens with the project. But the trees that you will be planting are intended to be shade trees and to sort right. of eventually create that sort of similar structure. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions about this? No. No. No, thank you for the clarification. Okay. Okay, you could close it. Thanks. Well, my interpretation is that those trees really can't support the the landscaping plan at all because um one of them is three feet higher and then one of them is um growing into a sewer pipe and then that northwest one was there reasoning for removing that one was it just in the detention basin yeah it looked like um there would be some grading within its uh, the root you know the drip line um and a significant portion of the canopies in the drip line. So it's one of those that, um, you know, when we walk the site with Alan Snow, he said it would be questionable whether or not um, it would remain. Um, okay. 
Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so let's just stick with landscaping right now um, as we sort of assemble our decision making here. Um, are there any among the commissioners, is there any discussion, further discussion about landscaping? I, I feel it... like it's been well explained and and um, meets with the intent of of creating um, and adding new shade trees, but also allowing for the um, water um, drainage and other things. Um, and it's, it still maintains a garden atmosphere. Um, and so I, I would support it, the plan. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think that it is, yeah, those sort of details will be missed with the Goshen stone, Goshen bench, um, and the veneer. And, you know, hopefully they will be included in future investments. And I guess there was also a question about <laughs> maintenance. Um, would you, did you want to address that? Sure, yeah. Um... In our in our current design, um, the back area with the Nomo is is much easier to maintain um, long term. Uh, near term, it does take sometimes up to three seasons to fully grow in. When you first we've we've used it on several projects, um, it looks a little bit like a chia pet when it first goes in. So some of that energy that's used for mowing um, benefits the project for doing some early uh, weed removal. Um, but once it grows in, it is really thick and it's kind of hard for the weeds to establish. Um, so long term, it's, you know, less, less mowing and then also um, less, less weeding um, with our, so, so I think in terms of that question of the NOMO versus the others, um, that is, that is in mind. Is the, and the overall landscape, is there any maintenance sort of? any comments you want to make about the maintenance sure. for that? Yeah, we were um, we were really careful to select varieties. So many species have different, you know, it's a whole beautiful world. It gets me so excited. Um, every every species that like hydrangeas, you know, there's so many hydrangeas. Um, but we were really careful to find ones that they're, they sort of maxed out, like the little guys um, that are maxed about three or four feet. Anything over that, we would you know, someone would probably want to be trimming for visibility and sight lines. So the Cunningham white rhododendron in the front um, maxes around three or four feet. Um, the, the the purple hydrangea, um, I think it's royal, royal star, is also a three to four feet. So anything that's in the shrub category in the front, we were sure to make sure that it wouldn't require trimming or pruning. Um, and uh, we are proposing a liriope mix with bulbs and the ground cover underneath. So again, reducing the need for mulching. Once that gets really thick and established, you do not have to bring in mulch, which I understand the library has to spend a couple thousand dollars a year um, bringing in mulch to maintain beds and it's less weeding too. So anything that we can cover the ground with planting um, can help, help with that weed competition. There may be some weeding in the future, um, but our hope is that this plan minimizes that impact. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, okay. I just want to ask, sorry, just to jump in. Um, <clears throat> last week, you said there would be more sight lighting, maybe bollard lighting in the front and in the back. And I just wasn't sure if, um, if you could describe that a little bit more, like if there's actually going to be more, sound like maybe along the walkway in the front or, or exactly what's happening with the lighting. Um, there was a plan shown, but I just, I, you know, sure. think about it tonight. There's, I feel like there's some questions about that. Sure. So one of the one of our goals is sort of to minimize barriers, and that's that's physical, and then that's visual. Um, and so for the lighting, it can be challenging to kind of balance out the foot candles, and then not have a lot of vertical obstructions. Um, so in the front. Then the original design where we had the Goshen benches on either side of the front entry, 
um, we were integrating LED lighting underneath that, like a scrim wall, and that was helping with our foot candles. When we when we beat out the benches, we needed to accommodate for that change in lighting. Um, so we've added an, one additional bollard on on each bed, uh, left and right of the front entry. Um, that that bollard is in a planting area, so it's integrated with the landscape um, and can won't be like a big pole pole on the site. Um, additionally, we we had ballers inside a walkway that we moved to the outside of the walkway at the front. So again, trying to reposition the lighting there. Um, in the in the back, um, there was an area in the corner. Oh, so it, we did um, we did change the the lighting configuration of the catenary lighting at that at that point where the wall is really close to the new addition. Um, and so we've added uh, a wall-mounted downlight in that area just to even out the candles on, on the site. So these are very small, subtle tweaks to kind of balance out the light um, in those areas. Here in the sorry, in the bollard lighting, how tall is are those bollards? I was trying yeah, to find it. Thirty-two or thirty-six. 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 Thanks, Jess. Okay. Um, I think we're ready to move on to the the next sort of VE change, right? Um, roof. Uh, we've been discussing synthetic slate versus slate. Um, in our previous hearing last fall, we arrived on synthetic slate and there was a pretty thorough discussion. Um, there's really nothing new to, that we've been presented with today, considering synthetic slate as, you know, I think it's, it's the same discussion. So, um, yeah. How do you feel, Pat and Hetty, about that? I know you, you were discussing these issues earlier in this meeting. I thank Antonia because she refreshed my memory about the fact that the roof is having leaking problems. I, I, I'm assuming that if it if it were possible to remedy by repairing the slate, that would be among our choices. I don't know whether that's a correct assumption or not. Um, I started out by saying that that I thought at least the streetscape should be slate. However, I I can accept in the interest of having a sound building that changing the roof to synthetic slate would be preferable. Hetty, do you have anything you want to say? I mean, I think the historic roof on the 1928 building is at the end of its life. I remember Ellen talking about that a year ago. Um, yes, I mean, yeah. I, I think that the um, the synthetic slate, the replacement of the windows with new um, are, are sort of non-negotiables. Um, in the back of my creepy little mind is this idea that uh, aren't these things possible with the plan B that the library trustees are also considering? Um, yeah, Hetty, I, I agree with you. I I, I accept I, the synthetic <laughs> slate for the soundness of the building, yeah. and and it will have a context context that that maintains the image of of history. And Austin said that they will consider new windows, and I. I think those are the two things in the integrity of maintaining the 1928 building that are important. Yeah. That, are, also, that, are, that are on the table right now anyway. And and there need to be no alternate alternates because right. if I was a contractor, I would be it would be very easy to look at what the options were and to bid lower. To be yeah. 
I, I think these are the only, uh, in my opinion, these are the only options. I would recommend that the synthetic slate and the new windows are the only options. We agree. Thank you, Austin. Okay. Um, and the book slot. Um, Ellen just shared with us the reasoning for its its positioning where it is. Um, and we did uh, mm -hmm. discuss it last year. We we discussed it in view of there being an automatic sorter, and that was the only place that was practical for it to be. I, I'm not going to hold out about this. I think it it mars the historical facade of the library. However, um, if 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 it relates to hand, handicap accessible returning of books, etc., and we also discussed that the color of the um, door, whatever, whatever we want to call it, the um, should be consistent with the plaque that's on the other side of the door. And so, if, if it's if if the bottom line is to make it more handicap accessible, I am in favor of handicap accessibility, and I wouldn't stand in the way of it being there. It just doesn't doesn't have the same function that was originally proposed. I think my concern, I think it will, but yeah. I think my concern about drop um, is that a lot of conversations happened, deliberations happened related to the interior rearrangement of some interior walls that connected the 1928 to the 1993 building. And I would like an assurance that those walls are not removed simply because down the road, the library would like to buy an automatic book sorter. At, at present, I'm not sure the library has the funds to, to do this project, um, VE or no VE. So, you know, it, it just seems like we're, 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 we're holding a candle for something that um, is, is uh, not, a, not a priority especially in relation to value engineering. And I, I don't want there to be any misunderstanding about decisions, design decisions that that are that are are being driven by the provision down the road of a book sorter, a mechanical book sorter. Right. I don't know how difficult it is to just install that um, opening when the book sorter materializes. Um, right, as opposed to keeping the current book drop under the covered roof on the east entrance. Isn't right. that related to the fact that everybody needs to be able to use the same book drop? But it's a it's a universal design issue, and well, be a separate book drop for people just because it's easier to access if you use a wheelchair or if you're blind or whatever issue there is. To right, you should be able to go in the front door. So. Exactly, exactly. Right. I, I'm wholeheartedly behind all of those goals for the project, but it won't be a book slot, book drop. And in, in the beginning, right? Well, it'll, it'll be it'll, a book drop. It will. It will. It's one of the mechanical. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. And so the book trap that exists up the walkway to the side annex will be dispensed with. Correct. Because that that's a staff that'll be a staff entrance pat. So if someone is needing to drop off a book, if they have to, if they're in a wheelchair or in crutch, crutches or what, some whatever, they have to go use that, come back around, and then go into the front entrance. That that's that's the problem. In the typically at a library, you have a book drop 
in the building somewhere so someone can do it off hours, use the book drop. Right. And and I'm familiar with the one in the annex. And I'm also familiar with the, the mailbox looking book drop that's, yep. that's at the sidewalk. And those have served me well. So I, I just wonder um, about, about, you know, changing the face of the, the facade mm -hmm. of the building on Amity Street to add that and and does does that add a convenience to the staff? Does it make because what's there right now is very accessible. It's it's a convenience to those who to the patrons of the library. The one out front, it overflows on a long weekend when the library is not open. It overflows and then you get books sitting on the ground. So and. So, because people don't always want to get out of their car and go into the drop it off at the book slot in the building. So the idea of the one at the front of the building, because we did study this and we analyzed it, is that it, it's it's it would be a lot of walking for someone who had trouble walking to use that side book drop and then come around and go in the front entry. That and that's that's part of so the reasoning. The uh, issue people is just don't don't go that, in the building they just drop their book off so they yeah, actually they have just to walk further up. um and so so the reason is that that entrance to the library is going to be closed correct okay can you make is a stand, so is, is standalone book drop going to be removed then i don't think so but that's a sharon question sorry I, I i just I, think we could Bigger, bigger book drop. I mean, clearly, this is a very good example where universal access isn't just an accommodation to people who have historically, through ADA requirements, asked for it. This is a win win where everybody benefits, everybody gets to do what's right more and just make a bigger book drop. I don't, and I, I don't. Hedy, I don't want to challenge you. I've never done or been in a library that didn't have an internal book drop just because of, and I'm sure MBLC would have a say in that, but I, I don't want to go down that road. I mean, Sharon's not here to speak to a bigger book drop or if they're going to still have the book drop. I don't know. Well, well, the issue is that, that we all use the book drop at the sidewalk or go into the library through the handicap accessible door in the annex. And so the real issue is that the, the design change is that is no longer going to be access to the library. And so that gives us this dilemma of whether we change the facade to have a book drop there, or we do two boxes at the sidewalk. I can't answer that question. Antonia, do you still want to speak? Sure. Um, I would say that in both our um, conversations last September, which I think took a lot, like a lot of our deliberations were actually over this um, drop. And I think we, I think to maintain um, what Pat was saying about keeping materials um, of this book drop in use with um, the current, like I guess, palette of the front entrance, I think would be paramount to me, although I do, I think if there are other solutions in this bid that could be explored, I'm for that. I would say I wouldn't vote specifically not to have this book drop on the facade, just given the importance, I think, of ADA and the fact that there will not be this other entrance um, that we are used to. And I think that when thinking about historical preservation, I also think mostly about like the patrons that are using this and maximizing that and accessibility to people who also historically have not always been that also, I guess, knowledge and um, accessibility to um, public spaces. So I think I would say that when thinking of historical importance, um, which I think is what, what we're here to do, I think we've looked at that, I guess, in other ways, in other specificities. And although I would hope that this could be maybe explored um, in a, another bid, I wouldn't vote um, to bar uh, that option. Well, I think yeah. ADA trumps is the trump card here, Antonio. You're right, and yeah. so if if it can be made as unobtrusive 
as possible and and be ADA accessible. I think that that's the trump card. Okay, Eddie. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm for universal design and for accessibility um, and for a more efficient library. Um, but I, I don't think that means that we need to put the hole in the wall right now. But I think the hole in the wall would serve a purpose Initially, even though there wouldn't be a book machine sorter behind it, right? It'd still be a book drop. Yeah, we're going right. to use the old director's office as the place where books get dumped. Um, I know that is something that the MHC has directly deliberated on and told us that, you know, that's that's a major change to a historic use of the building. Okay. Um, so those are really the major VE items from today. Um, the roof, the sash, and um, the book slot. And the landscape. And the landscape. But I feel as though the landscaping, we don't have any proposals for changes to that. And the roof monitor we considered last week and determined that it didn't have an effect on the historic building to remove it. And, and Madeline, was that window discussion as well last week? Yes. From the going windows, from curtain wall to regular aluminum windows. Oh yes, Actually that sort efficient. of bump yeah. out. Just mm -hmm. that that was just at the rear of the building, and um, correct. My that's my understanding. Those yeah. bump outs. I, I didn't want us to forget about that though. Thank you. Yes. So, Madeline, those items we voted in favor of last week. You just reiterated the ones that we really need to renew a vote for. Um, so it's and, right. So my, I'll just summarize what we've determined, what we've discussed, not what we've actually voted on. So we, um, for roofing, uh, we've been discussing synthetic slate shingles. Um, so we discussed the windows, we discussed the roof monitor, the curtain wall, and then the landscape VE items were to defer Goshen stone benches, defer the children's courtyard, defer stormwater garden plantings, reconfigure the rain garden bridge crossings, reduce paving in areas, um, and eliminate a stormwater system and eliminate the granite cladding at the retaining wall in the rear. Those are the VE items to be that are part of our hearing today. Um, so based on our discussion, I would say, I would make a motion to find that the, the commission finds that the value engineering changes are appropriate with the following conditions. Um, Concerning the roof, uh, we recommend synthetic slate as determined in the previous hearing and no asphalt shingles. Regarding the sash, we would require replacements for all window openings and no alternates. And um, And regarding the, the book slot, it can remain as is in keeping with the previous hearing. And um, I would also just state that our findings in the previous hearing still stand. 
and our recommendations there. So I would second that motion. If just a point of order, I are we can we not still say that we're observing the standards? We can we can keep discussing if you want. In relation to the BE um changes. So you, would you want you? <clears throat> there could be an amendment to the motion to say that mm -hmm. the changes were reviewed and are consistent with the preservation restriction and meet the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation with the following conditions, and it would reiterate then what Madeline had read. Okay. Let me read it again. Yes. Um, the commission finds that the value engineering changes are appropriate and meet the preservation restriction standards and comply with the Secretary of Interior's standards with the following conditions. that uh, the roof be synthetic slate as determined in our previous hearing and no asphalt shingles. Um, that for the windows, um, there will be replacements for all with no alternates. And that the um, book slot can remain as is. And that the um, findings of our previous hearings shall shall remain. Madeline, do we want to add the, the landscape design to that list? I don't think we found any recommendations to change the... the okay, thing. we just, do we need to approve it? I, I, I would, can... I, I would yeah. say, Pat, if, um, if you seconded, if you agree to that, those amendments, you could agree to the second again. And then there'd be another discussion about it. Okay, so I'll second what Madeline said and then amend it to include the design change BE changes. I think the motion has said that. And so I, since it was amended, we just kind of the same people who made it and then seconded it would have to do that again. Otherwise, we'd have to craft another motion again. Okay, so Bye. Madeline just made it again and then I should second it again. Okay. Could, I, I, not necessarily that we would agree with this, but I guess since we were having this discussion at the book drop, would we want to say that we may, I guess, for the purpose of um, a, uh, accessibility, um, like compliance, we would support that, but would recommend um, another bit, like another bid um, exploring other um, options? Or, I mean, I was just a question given there was a lot of contention about that I would say yes um other options for not including a, a hole in the wall or yeah like we wouldn't bar it but that it be explored Don't we have to be clear what we're asking in the bid from our potential contractors? You know, do I want where are, are we saying on the one hand we want you to make provision for pushing a hole into the historic director's office, library director's office, but we also want you to come up with alternatives. That, that seems um I feel like that's an architect's reveal. Yeah. Wait, which is an idea. Oh yeah, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, thank no, you. I, I like, I like lots of choices, Antonia, <laughs> and that's been the problem all along with this thing. You know, we've always not been able to address the real context for all the choices that we're making, and that's just something that I have to learn from. Thank you, Madeline and and Pat, for um, getting us to this point, and 
Um, well, it's thank you to everybody. Um, I think we have a motion in a second. Does it include the the book drop, Madeline? Yes. Yeah, so the so I I'll read it again. The commission thank you. finds the commission finds that the value engineering changes presented are appropriate and meet the preservation standard preservation restriction standards and comply with the Secretary of the Interior standards with the following conditions. Um, that the synthetic that the roof be synthetic slate and not asphalt no asphalt shingle. Uh, that the windows uh, are completely replaced with no alternates and that the book slot can remain as is in keeping with the previous hearing. Okay. And Tony, are you good with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Okay, so or now we need should we have a vote or do we go around? I think if there's no more discussion, we'd call the vote. Is there any more discussion? Okay. Um, Antonia? Hi. Pat? Hi. Teddy? No. <clears throat> okay, and I say yes. All right. And then we could have a motion to close the hearing. This was also a posted public meeting. And so um, unless there's any other comments it's from the library and the presenters, I think we've concluded the hearings. Um, so I, don't I just want to again say to all of you, um, thank you. You've put in hours and hours and hours, and I really appreciate all of that. I want to say yet again how grateful I am for the commitment of people across the town, even though we may not agree on the substance, the town is better for their participation. And lastly, I hope everybody has great confidence in the work that FAA and Rachel and her group have done. They've shown us, I think in the whole town, that they are responsive, that they are committed, and that they are patient with a process that has allowed everybody in town to have their say. So I'm really grateful to them. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so um, Madeline, I'd like a motion to close the hearing and then we could move on to the public meeting piece and it can be quick. So I make a motion that we close the public hearing. I second. Thank you. Okay, do we go around again? Sorry, I'm not. Yeah. Okay, Antonia. Oh, wait, close it. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Pat. Hi. Yes. Hi. Eddie. Hi. And yes, for me. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for Thank everything. You. Thanks for Thank you. Time. Good night. Thank you all very much. So the meeting, there's still a public meeting of the commission. Um, you know, the agenda had announcements and a few things. I don't have many. Um, one of the topics was, you know, we have a letter asking about 106 review and participation. And so, you know, the whole commission could attend. We'd, it'd have to be a posted public meeting, um, you know, talking with Bob Parent from the town, the idea would be to, you know, to vote to have a representative or two from the commission attend the 106 review. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how involved it'll be, how many meetings, um, and if anyone wants to volunteer from the commission, but to me, that, you know, that was the one piece on the agenda to discuss. I think there's 30 days to respond. And so I just want to make sure the commission, you know, has a chance and then set a next meeting date. And so I think those are the two pieces I'd, I'd want to discuss today. 
And if we don't come to a decision about 106, as long as we have a meeting in September, you know, it will probably be within the 30 days. I just, it's something that, you know, the commission should, you know, discuss. Is there a date set for the meeting, the, the 106 hearing or pre preparation or whatever it's called? I don't, I don't know if there was actually a, um, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I saw anything about a date. Then okay. so there's a, there's a follow-up, our meeting in September, our regular Amherst Historical Commission meeting in September, and then there's the 106 review meeting or meeting. Right. But I, when is the right, what would be the regular scheduled commission meeting in September? I have the ninth uh, on my yeah. calendar. A mon uh, Monday, the ninth. Yeah, yeah, Monday the ninth. Yep. Yeah. Wait. Can we do? I I, I can only do seven p.m. now. This um, instead of six thirty. That's that looks like, better. Fine. That works. Better. That, that works better for me too. All right. Yeah, that's fine. So it's the ninth at seven. And do we we want to just put off the review of the, or discussion of the one hundred six? Um, um, or would you want to just you know if anyone's that's, interested? I'm interested in. I'm interested. Yeah, we should. I think we should um, come up at least with a tentative date so that it so that it's kind of moving along with everything else as part of the process yeah and you know we could vote to have so I, you know, I think what i'd want is the commission to vote to have representatives be part of the 106 review so if it were hetty and madeline there'd be a vote of the commission saying that you can re represent the commission as the 106 review consulting party okay I mean, I don't, I don't want to. I nominate. Um, is that how it works? Sure, I, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, nominate to be represented, Hetty and Madeline, um, on behalf of our commission. I second. It's so small commission. <laughs> <laughs> is is there a reason that? Um, Michaela is not able to be present. I, I mean, yeah, I I think Michaela has um, essentially resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, her her you know she was reappointed at the end of June, and originally she said she would stay on um, to hear the Jones case and a little bit. But uh, after the even before the first hearing last week, she said she's just been really busy, and she had wanted to resign. And I asked her if she could stay on in case we needed a quorum. And so, um, you know, she had, a, she actually, I think wanted to resign, um, you know, July, in July, but I had asked her just to stay on. Um, so yeah, we have vacancies now. Uh, well, I appreciate the time and effort she put into serving. Thank you. Yeah. Please thank her for us. Yeah, and I, there had been some, volunteer form submitted I mean, mon months ago now I, I you know i think we hopefully that we can robin had emailed the town manager's office a bit ago and just said you know could we revisit that and see if there's any anyone who's still interested and available but i don't, I don't know what that process is because it'd be nice to have you know sorry i guess we have did we, have, we, didn't, did we didn't vote on the nomination but so this would be the only four that could vote anyways because Robin has to recuse herself. So there's not, you know, if we wait to the ninth, there maybe that's why we asked. There's no other members that would be, you know, part of this discussion. So it 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 would be two of us then. That's fine. Yeah. So it's, it's um yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds fine. Are we still taking public comments at this point or um, as part of the public meeting or are we all done? We could. We just haven't had a vote on that motion. Did we Did we vote on that, the 106 review? Did I miss no. That? Uh, we, so, had a, we had two votes, but then Hetty and I didn't want to vote for ourselves. So I guess I vote uh, yes as well. Yes, I vote for myself. Gosh. <laughs> Unanimous. No <What's> problem. <laughs> 
be careful what you wish for. Isn't that one of those things that you might say? Yeah. I would appreciate also like understanding how to inform the other commission members about process and what comments we would are putting forth. Yeah, I think, you know, it'd become a, a standing item on the agendas. And so it could be, you know, report back on the 106 review. You know, I'm not sure either, you know, I think it'll be a facilitator to review. Um, you'll probably be given, you know, packets of information. There'll be a meeting or meetings to review the project. And, you know, I, I don't, I mean, sometimes yeah. a 106 review can take months. You know, sometimes it can be short, sometimes it can be very lengthy. And so, you know, there's a number of consulting parties or potential consulting parties that were uh, um, asked to join the 106 review. And, that, you know, there's 30 days to respond or acknowledge. I think they have to respond within 30. I think it's more than just acknowledge. I think they have to respond uh, within 30 days that they're interested and have a representative or someone who will attend. And so the 106 review group could be really big. I mean, it could be, um, I mean, uh, you know, knowing, seeing the the letter, I mean, it could be like 20, 30 people. If consulting parties have two people each, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I'm just, yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, I mean, I think the commit, you can report back to the commission. Um, you know, I think you've seen the project and you've, you know, you've been on the review of the library. So I think you understand some of the position. I think there'll be, you know, there could be other questions asked, right? I mean, you might be applying, you know, the standards again, you'll have other information to review. Um, so, and it, you know, it'll involve the interior. I think it's, you know, a really a, a pretty thorough look at the project, so. Okay. I see a hand raise in the public, can we? Sure, uh, Maria, you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. <clears throat> this was thoroughly disappointing. You guys had a chance to fix your mistake and you didn't take it. You did not apply the standards. I suggest that all of you go back, rewatch all of the meetings as I have a number of times, read the transcripts, look at what was in the packets. You did not perform your duties. You did not go through the standards last time and you sure as heck didn't do it this time. And you voted to say that these plans meet the standards. You also allowed yourselves to be pushed towards something. You were, you were given bad instructions. You were told that you didn't it isn't necessary that you go and do your job. You were not told that you can't do your job. This is, it's extremely disappointing. You know, some of us have been trying to get onto committees for a very long time. Some of us have been trying to get on this committee for a very long time. And it's really disappointing when people who have done their homework and understand what's going on and want to serve, have to sit here and watch you get bullied into a position. And why we should be being grateful and thankful to designers who are making thousands of dollars every time they show up for these meetings is beyond me. So no, this was not this this was just not in any way meeting your duties. And I hope that you fix this somehow. You have a 106 review coming up. You know, when I talked about the family whose father built this building, they were crushed. They are absolutely beside themselves. Four generations of Amherst residents are crushed because of what is planned for this building. There is no reason for this, this plan to be in such violation. And that's not your problem that they handed this to you and then said, hurry up, approve it. Please go back read the standards, read what you said, 
read what was done, read what was in the packet. I hope this doesn't happen for any other historic structure in this town. Thank you. There's a few more hands, Madam, if you want to recognize them. Okay, yes. Um, Arlie, mm -hmm. you're allowed to speak. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, just on the 106, um, Mr. Malloy said it might be short, it might be long. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, you know, the timeline of this whole rebidding and uh, process is, is quite speedy. They want to get their bids out, you know, mid-September uh, or, so, you know, so that essentially is about two and a half weeks. So um, this is uh, kind of a it's going to be a speedy process, whatever it is, because I don't think they're going to want to stretch this out because they need to get their documents in order to send out for bidding. Um, anyway, I just get ready for a thing. Be aware this is going to probably be kind of quick. Thank you. At least in my estimation. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Okay, um, Christopher Benfi. Yes. Um, I feel that the town's approach to the historic preservation considerations regarding the Jones Library project project have just been derelict from the very beginning. Um, the Section 106 review process should have been started at the beginning of this whole planning process. I mean, the regulations, the guidelines make that perfectly clear. Now we are at the 11th hour. The process haven't, hasn't even begun. Um, the town sent out this project for bids last spring hadn't done the uh, NEPA review, hadn't done a Section 106 review, if there had been a successful bid, those uh, reviews never would have happened. And the town would have lost the funding from uh, the federal sources. Um, and I just want to say that the town's dereliction of duty is going to become very front and center in the Section 106 process, because those federal agencies are going to be looking very carefully at how badly the town has managed this from the very beginning. And, um, you know, you're going to have to live with that. Uh, and, and I think it's really a shame. Um, you know, I'm new to Amherst politics, and I have to say it's just appalling. So, um, you know, I, I hope that you will do a decent job with the Section 106 process. Um, you're obligated to. Uh, I think a lot of people are watching and expecting you to do a good, thorough, careful job, and I just pray that you do it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Let's see, sorry. Um, Cameron. Or I think that's, uh, yes, you can speak. Thank you. Uh, actually, Carol Gray, um, and sorry that it's, I don't know how to change the name on my phone. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to reiterate what the other speakers have said, Maria Kopicki and others, but I totally concur that um, you, you had a legal duty to follow the standards. And I think if you are going to flatly reject what the Mass Massachusetts Historical Commission has said in terms of there being five standards being violated, you have a legal duty to say why you think they're wrong. 
why exactly are those five legal standards, which they who have more expertise than all of us in the room have said are violated, are not being violated in your view. I think just pretending that you can just all say, you know, or not all, but that those of you who vote in favor, just do it because it's your personal opinion that you want to do it is not good enough. You actually have to say how you're complying with the law. Why aren't those standards? Why are those standards being met when this other body that has expertise says that five out of 10 are not being met? I don't think you're meeting your burden of, of, of executing your legal duty. And that's very concerning to me. Um, and for the 106 review, again, that is a chance to make it right. And I really hope that you'll take it. And I'd hope that you'll see yourselves not as just, is this a good project that you want to vote for? That's that's not the question at all. You have to impose the legal standards. And, and if you were faced with no report from some other entity that said standards were being violated, then maybe, you know, just having a thumbs up vote and, and not giving the legal reasoning might be justifiable. But considering that you're presented with a memo with the most authoritative body in the state saying half the legal standards are being violated, for you not to say anything about the law and just give it a thumbs up is, um, is not uh, in keeping with what your legal duty is. I think it's, it's um, violating your legal duty. Thank um, you. I also wanted to say, um, I heard Nate Malloy say that there are um, perhaps dozens or at least many consulting parties. Um, if there's a document that says who the other parties are that are seeking to be consulting parties, I, it would be helpful if that could be in your packets or in a way that the public could access that. Or uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Malloy could actually tell us who are these other parties uh, that are wanting to be consulting parties. And uh, what does a consulting party have to do other than say, yes, please provide us with all documentation being provided to the commission and please provide us of all meeting times. What, what does a consulting party have to do to make sure they're fully informed both in writing and of meetings? Thank you. Um, Carol, I would reach out to Bob Parent uh, in the town. So I, I'm not I only know this because I work with the historical commission, but he was the one helping um, with the, you know, the 106 review. So I, I don't, I could find the letter, but uh, I think, you know, I think the 106 review allows for many people to be considered consulting parties. So if um, he's the project capital manager, he works on the second floor in town hall. If you reach out to again, Bob parent, he, he would be able to help you. My, maybe I also the, see it. It's on the Jones Library website too. Slash JonesLibrary.org slash building project has a list of the consulting parties. Oh, good. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, Rita Burke. Yes, um, I just have two things I want to um, ask about, I guess. Um, tonight, Mr. Sarat contradicted, or he began um, by stating something that was contradictory to even what several of you stated after that um, with regards to receipt of the letters the infamous letters and um, the information contained in them last fall. It, that confuses me. You've got somebody actually willing to come on a public call and say, all these people, for example, me, Reed Burke, are saying that the, the information, the letters, the existence of them were kept from the public and from a lot of people like yourselves involved in all of this and the decision making regarding it. And yet several of you, and I appreciate it, I applaud you, had the courage to say, basically, no, Austin, 
That's not how it went down. Why isn't anybody questioning this kind of contradiction? We're supposed to be able to have faith in the people who are appointed or elected. How can we do that? Why don't we have all these questions? Why wouldn't we have all these questions? Why wouldn't we be up in arms, if you will? Because this is not an isolated situation with this project or with others that people like me who have been here for 50 years have experienced. Now it's not just on a, a tape. It's not just, Lordy, I hope they have tapes. It's live in front of us. This is, this is a real important aspect of all of this and feeds directly into why this particular project has divided this town so dramatically. All anybody I assume wants is the truth. And when you've got appointed or elected leaders blatantly not telling it, even when the people they're working with, like members of your committee are saying, Man, basically no, the people questioning this are, are, are accurate. We didn't get information from these letters. We didn't even know they were there. So I'm going to stop right now with that because clearly <laughs> it's really pissing me off and none of you are going to be able to stand up to him, them, or do anything about it. So that's sad for all of us. Okay. Um, the other thing is I've been very active as a 50 year resident of Amherst, but I'm new. Um, I'm, I'm late to this dance with regards to participating in um, ACH um, meetings. And, I, and, and it, I'm being perfectly like calm and legitimately curious. I don't understand with all due respect, Mr. Malloy, what your, what your role is here. I, I don't think you're a member of the AC, AHC. And yet as somebody new to watching these meetings and listening and trying to absorb things and get my head around it, you sure sound like you are. Um, You've given as much participation as the members who are and way more direction. So if you could just clarify for me, I know you hold a very high position in town. I know nothing about your department, but I just so that I know the players because I, I don't have a roster in front of me and what I have seen doesn't compute with, uh, with what I, what's happening. Could, could I please ask somebody to define what your role is in all? Why are you consulting with the town's attorney and not members of the committee whose meeting this is, who should know this information for firsthand? Are you a liaison? Is this your role to participate as a quasi member of this body? I, I really honestly don't know. So I'm just asking for clarification. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I'm a planner with the town and I'm staff liaison to the commission. And so, you know, if there are questions in terms of legality of things, we don't ask that the commission contact the staff, the town attorney, I do that as staff. And so, okay. you know, so I, I, you know, communicate with applicants to projects, whether it's for demolition review or for preservation restrictions. So, you know, I manage, you know, all of that intake and then facilitate and process it to the commission and with the commission. And so, you know, in a community that may not have staff, maybe the chair of the commission is doing more of that. Maybe they're mm -hmm. doing the application reviews, they're contacting attorneys, they're, you know, doing all these other things, but because we have staff, that's what I do. And okay. So, um, so it so in that in that role, it's appropriate for you to be telling them to move on or that they don't have to regard certain um, rules. I mean, you, you really have been directing them and, and you have to, you, you certainly, I mean. Yeah. So I, so I'm framing the conversation. So mm, sure that's that, an interesting that way of, of that's an interesting way of describing it. Go ahead. Yep. I want to make sure the commission is acting, you know, with due diligence and not being arbitrary and capricious. So mm -hmm. if for instance, the commission is like, you know what, there's, there's a lot of public comment. Now we're just going to rescind what we did last year and just hear it all over again there has to be a really solid reason to do that and so in speaking with the town attorney 
they said that, well, the commission did hear the project. You know, we spent, you know, a few evenings doing that. We had presentations, we had meeting materials. And so, you know, that's my role is to say that, that you have to be cautious if you're going to do that. Or mm -hmm. here's how the standards can be applied to this project. And so, you know, if they're talking about the windows and the commission was having questions about the windows last week, I said, well, what I'm hearing is keep all the existing or all new, but let's not have a mix. And let's have the commission make a decision on what that could be. Okay, right? so you you are directing the, the conversation or the meeting in a sense, because, you know, that I would think that what you just used as an example would be for them to decide, not for you to tell them that's what they should decide. I'm not making a decision for them. I'm saying uh -huh. I'm summarizing their conversation and what okay. they were talking about was, you know, what do we do with the windows? And there's discussions of let's have them be all new. Let's repair all the existing, but we want them to be all the same. And so I summarized that and said, if that's how, how you're doing it, then your motion should have some of that language in there. I'm not and saying that all sounded one way, that all sound, one way or the other. That all sounded perfectly fine, but you know, 30 seconds ago, you were never mind. Um, this isn't the place for you and I to have this conversation. I really didn't understand what your role was supposed to be, and I was very confused by what I was saying, seeing your role was actually being. But thank you. I appreciate some explanation for it. And now I'm the wiser. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Let's see, uh, Lee Edwards. Thank you. You yeah, are allowed to speak. So. Ask to unmute. Okay, ask to unmute. If you could unmute yourself, Lee. Okay. Maybe they're not there anymore. Oh, maybe, okay. Let's try somebody else and then come back to Lee. Jeff Lee. Hi, this is Jeff Lee. Just wanna correct a couple things and point out a way that this process might have been improved. Um, it's been said that there are different standards for uh, judging historic tax credits. Well, the first letter that identified adverse effects from the Mass Historic Commission was not about historic tax credits. It was in response to the project notification form, which was submitted last October. And that's required because the project is receiving state and federal grant money. So that should be made clear. Secondly, uh, I don't understand why you met last October to uh, to evaluate compliance with the preservation restriction agreement when all you had to do is wait a few more weeks and you would have had the response from the Mass Historic Commission, which would have informed you that all these secretary standards were violated. That's the way it should have been done. And I'm really disappointed that it wasn't. Thank you. Thank you. I think we were required. Um, is that true, Nate? Yeah, we didn't, you know, we, it was the request of the applicant, you know, so we, you know, at the same time, they're going through other permitting. And so it wasn't the commission, you know, if, if the library had said to have hold, held a hearing earlier or later or submitted information, that's what the commission would respond to. So it wasn't necessarily the commission's decision to have a hearing then is that we were given, you know, according to the restriction, a letter with those changes and we have so many days to respond to that. And so it was, you know, following that process, it wasn't, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, the, whether or not the sequence of events could have unfolded differently, that's how the commission responded. And so I, yeah, I, I don't. Just think it would have been a much more informed process if you had received the input from the Mass Historic Commission. 
for assessing the PRA. But we did have the PNF. Um, we did know about MHC's response to the PNF, and we did address that in our meeting. But I think that happened after your October meeting, that's my understanding. We addressed it at the interiors meeting. Okay, well, regardless, um, it seems that a lot of violated standards were not considered last last year. Okay, thank you for your comment. You're welcome. Um, let's see, Ken. Rosenthal. Thank you very much, Ken Rosenthal on Sunset Avenue. I'm sorry to prolong this, but I just want to uh, try to make the point, Nate, that th you've heard from three of us who happen to be lawyers tonight, who are trying to explain that when a commission like this, which is a quasi-judicial body, reaches a decision as you did last fall, and then you have additional information, you have an obligation, a right but also an obligation if the information is going to perhaps affect your decision to open it up again and reconsider it. I, I, I hate to bring a, an example that is not yours, but look at what happened with the Central Park Five in New York who were wrongly convicted. And when then when information came out about who the proper culprit was, they were retried and, 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 and released. Now, you're not a criminal court and you're not a formal court, but you're a quasi-judicial body. And you have to deal with the information you have and only the information you have. And when additional information comes that might affect your decision, like those letters after your decision earlier in the fall, you have an obligation to consider from the beginning. So it is not sufficient for you to say, well, we decided it already in September. You did, but you decided it without complete information. You may reach the same decision again. That's very likely and very possible. And here you did it with a couple of exceptions, but you do have to reconsider it if you get such information. And um, uh, Nate, check with your lawyers. I think they'll tell you that. Uh, is so I'm sorry to bother you with it, but I think that's what the, at least three of us who are lawyers tonight were trying to tell you. Thank you all again for spending so much time on this. Uh, this is important to so many of us, those, as Austin Sarrett said, those who disagree with him, as well as those who agree with him, those who disagree with you, as well as those who agree with you. Thank you very much for considering all the things you have. We really, we, we do appreciate it. And good evening. Thank you for your comment. Um, Lee Edwards, I'm, I'll ask you to speak once more if you can unmute yourself. Okay, I think they might just not be there. And I see Maria. Hi, Please. thank you again. Yeah, Marie Kubicki, South Amherst. Just to be clear on timeline here, the only reason that you were asked to weigh in when you did was because they wanted to get this out. To, they want, and not sorry, not even out to bid. They wanted to bring this before town council to ask for another $10 million on top of the $36 million in borrowing. And they wanted to do that as soon as they could. But here's the thing. You knew, well, you should have known, you should have been informed by people in the library project, most specifically by the director, that the MHC application was in process. They had requested additional information. They supplied that additional information between your two hearings, between September and October. And there, the vote was taken at town council in December. By the end of December, you had the de letter that definitively said you're not getting these tax credits and you have violated all these standards. They didn't put this out to bid until January. Had any of that information, that 
they were had a, they were worried about it MHC in November they said they weren't going to do it in this you're not getting it in December it violated these standards there were letters that said that you should have initiated a section 106 process all of this happened before the town council took its vote all of this happened before this went out to bid and all of that information was suppressed the town did not have the information it was entitled to before it made these decisions. You did not have the information. You were given erroneous information in your packets. Look, you, when mistakes are, you, you are not responsible for people not giving you the information, but once you have learned this, you have to go back and deal with it. A lot of things have happened because of this suppression of information. Votes were taken. Money was authorized based on faulty and withheld information. This is serious business. Now, you've got a Section 106 process, which has not been conducted properly so far. It's not been conducted at all. And it remains to be seen if it will be conducted properly. Some of you are going to be sitting on that. You have, again, an obligation not to push through a project just because some people want you to push it through, not to comply with the building committee or the designer's urgency to fix a bunch of stuff that they got wrong. You have an obligation to apply the law. Please you. do it. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. I did um, see the that the um, the in May the, that Epsilon submitted the application for MHC tax credits. And then August, they received a letter that it was incomplete. That letter is regarding um, whether the project is income producing, if whether the library is income producing or not. And that's not, that doesn't have much um, of an impact upon our decision. That wouldn't have really impacted our decision, I don't believe. Having known whether we had known that or not, obviously, um, but just keeping to that. And then in August 30th, I see MHC received additional material from Epsilon that was also just required regarding the income producing component because a tax tax credits are only available, federal tax credits are only available to income producing historic properties. So you have to prove that you have an income so it can't be a home, for example. Um, so that was the, and in my understanding, that was the correspondence that was going back and forth before our hearing in September. Here, I'll, I'll push you back on if you want to speak. Yeah, no, thank you. I know that is, yes, but the point is, until they had a complete application, they could not make their ruling. They could not sort of, they could not offer the second certification. They could not give you a definitive answer on this. These are our findings. Yes, it was, be, it was incomplete because they didn't have other stuff, but that wasn't the problem. And that wasn't why they rejected it. That wasn't why they rejected standards. They simply could not give you their findings until they had a complete application. So yes, that was the reason. But the point is, they were in receipt. MHC was in receipt of things by fully by October 12th. And if you knew that, if you knew the MHC is working on it, but they couldn't give us an answer yet because they didn't send in a complete application. Why don't we wait to see what they say? That would have made sense. And then you would have just simply said, hey, hang on. The MHC, who has a lot more knowledge about all of this, is working on this. They're going to give us an answer. There was nothing immediately pending in October. There was no urgency for you to make that ruling in October, knowing full well that you were going to have additional critical information. Look, I'm not 
I'm not upset with you guys for all the all the shenanigans that went on in the fall. Right? That wasn't your fault. But you know, but there are consequences to what happened there. And now that you know all this, that's what you have to act on. Thanks. All right, thank you. I think that's everybody. Let's see, I don't see any more hands raised. Yeah, I mean, I don't, there wasn't really anything else on the agenda. So, you know, we can, you know, just move to adjourn and uh, meet again on the 9th. Unless there's anything else someone else to, you know, really talk about. I don't have any, anything else. Uh, I am a little concerned that we now have two vacancies on the commission. Um, and in relation to this project, fearless leader has to recuse herself. Um, so I think that has an impact, um, on how well we can do our work, how, how much information expertise we can bring to the table. Um, I, I know of people who've applied to, to be on the commission who are extremely well qualified and have been rejected, um, Amherst is full of very well-informed people. Um, so I, I would just um, encourage anyone who's interested, um, who cares about um, the historic quality and identity of Amherst to step up to the plate. And I can I vote to adjourn? Madeline? Oh, oh. oh. Antonio, so sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, also, I guess for all the commissioners, I didn't think it was necessary to I guess, say um, and respond to every public comment, but I've never taken a course with Sarah, um, even though I go to Amherst College and I'm not enrolled, but I just wanted you guys to know that. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, I talked with my supervisors and they don't see that as an apparent conflict or any financial okay. conflict there. But yeah, I, I, I'll, yeah. Uh, I'll email uh, Robin, I mean, and, and the town manager's office tomorrow about the vacancies because, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I know someone applied, Robin had actually asked someone uh, who seemed really qualified, I think it was, gosh, I don't, I don't want to say it's a year ago, but it was a long time ago and I'm not sure what happened, but, um, you know, and we had a vacancy at the time. And so I don't, I don't, if they're still willing and they had submitted, um, you know, form, so. It'd be nice because right now, right now, if one of you is absent or something, we just have four members, and you know if something else happens, we can't have a hearing or a meeting, and so it, it's nice to have you know at least six. You know, it'd be nice to have seven, but at least six members, just so there's a little bit of a cushion to having a minimum for a quorum. Yeah, well, maybe following the last few weeks, there'll be interest in applying. Thank you. I'm voting that we adjourn. I mean, I second. We adjourn. <laughs> I second that. Bye. We'll vote with our uh... everybody. <laughs> Leave then. Thanks, everyone. I'm leaving this little this little door here in the corner. <laughs> That's me. Going right through that door. <laughs> Bye. Bye.